Good morning. Welcome to our uh, exciting event today. My name is Doug Blizzard with Catapult. Uh, before I kick it over to Bruce Clark to officially introduce us, it's my job to do some obligatory uh, announcements as you're all used to. Uh, yes, we are recording this event today. That'll be shared with you uh, post event. So if you miss it or have to drop off or if one of your coworkers misses it, happy to have you share that. Uh, we will have, there's a few slides today. We'll make sure those are shared as well. Um, Everyone is muted, so uh, if you have a question, we encourage you to just go on the chat function there. We will be monitoring those questions and either answering them ourselves or if, it, if it's relevant for a presenter, uh, when time allows, we'll, we'll ask the presenter as well. So with that, uh, we've tried to allow multiple breaks today. We've got a lot to go through. Uh, welcome, and with that, I'll kick it over to Bruce Clark. Bruce? Doug, thank you, my friend, and thank you for all the work you've done to put together this program. It's taken a lot to do it. It's going to be very exciting and very informative, and I think that those that uh, stay with us through both sections of this program are going to come away with a very different and deeper understanding of the financial background and financial models in healthcare, as well as what you can do about it. I'm Bruce Clark, and along with Kenny Colbert, I'm co-CEO of Catapult Employers Association. Catapult is the recent merger of CAI in Raleigh and the Triad, as well as TEA in Charlotte. This event is evidence of our continued joint intention to double down on our histories of identifying and understanding and filling gaps and hurdles in the marketplace for small and mid-sized employers, gaps that the marketplace just won't fill or won't fill affordably. In the 1990s, as an example, together as partners, we saw workers' comp insurance carriers leaving North Carolina for very because of very high claims costs and very bad court cases that made it uneconomical to write insurance in North Carolina. In response, we formed the state's largest self-insured fund to make workers' compensation costs more affordable for employers, especially smaller employers. Later, we helped reform the statutes and we helped to, to make uh, help the markets to stabilize. Healthcare costs are in a similar, but more complicated spiral for most employers and they impact everyone, including employees. The largest employers have a bigger toolkit of options to slow these problems down and even reverse them in some cases. We want to bring that same kind of toolkit and those kinds of options to the small and mid-sized employers, particularly those that are currently fully insured or level funded, but also to those that are self-funded and using a large insurance carrier network for claims processing and, and pharmaceutical pricing. A few statistics we have all seen that describe the problem. I'm not going to bore you, but it's worth starting out with this level understanding. Premiums are up 59% in 10 years. A family premium now is uh, up to $21,202, according to our own survey data. Deductibles are up 98% to an average of $3,862 per family. Wages are up only 23.9% in North Carolina. Employers can't sustain these rising costs. You know, Doug reminded me, we, we've been saying that for 20 years or maybe 25, uh, but we really can't. And employees need a better option. 68% of personal bankruptcies are for medical expenses. 25% of workers with insurance refuse medical care due to out-of-pocket costs. Typical employer response to all this is, and you know it, is to shop the plan every few years, raise deductibles, try HRAs, move to a high deductible plan with HSAs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, spread the pain. Everybody takes some pain. The problem is the underlying drivers of excessive costs and even variable quality are still in place. We have two objectives today. First, our first objective is to describe the problem in some detail and even why that problem exists. I think that's very important before you start thinking about what your options are. And secondly today, to talk with you about solutions that may fit your workplace. They don't fit every workplace, but they may fit yours and give you some good options and some good tools. There is no easy button here. All of this takes work, but all around the country, locally driven disruption of the status quo is working. This is not brand new. It's just very local. You will hear from doctors, pharmacists, brokers, executives, and HR professionals about what's really going on, both from a cost and care perspective in our program today. You will hear from one of my very favorites, Dr. Eric Bricker, on understanding healthcare costs by uh, the old adage, following the money. 
you'll learn about the misaligned incentives that exist throughout the healthcare ecosystem and the impact they have on us all. You'll hear from Dave Chase, a national leader in healthcare reform as to many of the models that already exist that challenge the status quo. And you'll hear from a panel of experts um, that, that uh, on existing and new financing models that afford access to innovation without the level of risk that they once required or that you may assume are required. I'm gonna give you a short disclaimer. We are a neutral party at Catapult. We are not a broker, we're not a provider, we're not a carrier. We are not starting an insurance company. We are passionate about improving group health plans in our region. Healthcare costs have exploded over time for many reasons. Understanding those reasons and how employers can address them by regaining some transparency and control over choice of provider, over pharmacy benefits and such is key. You will hear some outrageous things today. I, I find them outrageous and I bet you will as well. But rather than blame any institution or provider, I encourage everyone to think about the concepts presented in the second half of our time today. Think about your plans and your employees and your financial health. Engage with us to forge a new path. It's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter today. He's Dr. Eric Bricker. He's one of my favorite thought leaders and educators on the financial realities, hey doctor, uh, in, in modern American healthcare. I spoke with him over a year ago to get some advice on uh, what the heck do we do about this locally? Uh, and he helped to start us down the path that we're on today and we appreciate him for that. Dr. Bricker is an internal medicine physician who graduated with honors from the University of Illinois College of Medicine and completed residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Dr. Bricker was also co-founder and chief medical officer of Compass Professional Health Services. Compass is a health navigation company that grew to 1.8 million members and 2,000 employer clients, including T-Mobile, Southwest, and Chili's Magianos. Compass was acquired by Alight Solutions in July 2018. Dr. Bricker is the founder of A Healthcare Z, which is 200 plus healthcare finance educational videos found free of charge on YouTube, LinkedIn, and ahealthcarez.com with over 90,000 views per month, which is where I first became introduced to Dr. Bricker. Dr. Bricker's recent book, Healthcare Money Campfire Stories, is a must read for anyone trying to understand the current business models in healthcare delivery and how they are hurting everyone. You know, the last thing I'll say is this really is not about good people versus bad people. This is mostly about entrenched business models and financial models that drive bad consequences. Dr. Bricker, thank you for being with us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Bruce. Just a quick check, can you hear me okay? Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much to Catapult and thank you so much to all of you for watching today. I am, I'm coming to you from uh, outside of Dallas, Texas. As we live in the age of COVID, I had some driving, or I've got three kids, I had some driving around at the kids to do, so I'm in my car, but I was able to put my Tar Heel Blue tie on. So I know they said it was business casual, but I'm like, what do I have that's Tar Heel Blue? It's like this tie is like literally the only thing. So I had to wear the tie. So I am just so excited to be with all of you today. And I am going to speak with you specifically about a lot of the, the misalignment that occurs in your employee health plan with your vendors, frankly, the people that you have historically used to provide employee benefits to and care to your employees. And let's talk about specifically how that misalignment affects not only the financial bottom line of your plan, but also um, just the, 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 the quality of the care of your employees as well. And so I'm gonna read this quote because I'm, I'm speaking with many uh, CEOs and CFOs and business owners. Of course, all of you are familiar with Berkshire Hathaway and Charlie Munger, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. He is also on the board of a hospital in Los Angeles. So if there's anybody who knows a lot about business and healthcare, it's actually Charlie Munger. And he says, it, healthcare is out of control and the incentives are wrong. And so another famous Charlie Mungerism are, is that incentives are superpowers. So you can get the smartest, most well-intentioned people in the world, but if you put them in a system that incentivizes them in a certain way, then you're gonna get what you incentivize. And certainly all of you running businesses uh, know that. So uh, next slide, please. And I, so I actually live on a small farm outside of Dallas. So you're gonna get pictures 
from around my farm today on the slide. Now, I actually don't have donkeys, but my neighbor has donkeys. So this is my neighbor's donkeys that you're looking at uh, through the fence over there. So really, when you hear about innovation in healthcare and innovation in employee benefits, what that means for you as a as a business owner or as a business you know runner and executive is it, it's really incentive alignment innovation okay it's not technology it's not software what you're looking for for solutions for your challenges with your health plan are really around aligning the incentives with what you want and really the old model really the the model that exists largely today is one of misalignment because you as employers, you want your employee health plan to be obviously high quality. I mean, your business is nothing without your people, but you also want good financial stewardship of that plan, not only by your employees, but by all the doctors and the hospitals and the insurance company. This is your money. You don't want anybody wasting your money. And at the end of the day, even you as a small, fully insured employer, you're bearing most of the risk. And this is not just true in North Carolina, it's true across the country. Many of you, you, as is in Texas, many of you are using uh, Blue Cross as your insurance. And when you have high uh, claims, a lot of times that just turns around and, and increases your premium. So insurance, by definition, is the transference of risk. Well, if you keep paying more premium every year, well, that's not much insurance, right? Essentially, you're still bearing all of the risk, right? And, and you got to think about, okay, well, if you changed your hat and you were the CEO of an insurance company, well, the insurance carrier, they want more revenue, they want higher margins, and at the end of the day, they actually don't want to bear risk, right? Risk is kind of like a hot potato. To the extent that they can have somebody else bear the risk, they want to do that. Likewise, doctors and hospitals that your employees and your plan members see, they thrive on two things. They thrive financially on patient volume and fee-for-service payment. So I'm going to tell you, the most important thing I'm going to tell you today is the healthcare cost equation. All of you, I'm sure, are very good at math. This is a very simple equation. Okay, healthcare cost is equal to the number of units of healthcare times the price per unit. So the number of units of healthcare is literally like patient volume. It's the number of CT scans. It's the number of tests. It's the number of procedures. And then the fee for service price per per unit is okay. The CT scan cost a thousand dollars. The surgery costs ten thousand dollars. And so all you do is you take those number of units and you multiply it by the cost per unit. And you're trying to make that go down while doctors and hospitals are financially incentivized to make both of those numbers go up as much as they can, right? So they live on patient volume and having high fee for service reimbursement. So that's, that's kind of the world we live in today. And if you could go to the next slide. So I'm gonna go through sort of category by category what the specific um, misalignments are and not all of them are obvious. Okay, so first of all, doctor misalignment. Believe it or not, kickbacks by pharmaceutical companies to doctors are illegal uh, per Medicare. So it's actually called the anti-kickback statute. However, uh, pharmaceutical companies and doctors have been able to get around this with what are referred to as honoraria. Well, doctors, are paid speaking fees. Now, I've been to many of these quote unquote talks. They're at fancy restaurants. There's very little quote unquote education. And it's mostly just a fancy dinner at a fancy restaurant. They even have had situations where the talks never happened at all. And the physician just received the honoraria. So actually, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, Novartis, got into a whole bunch of trouble for this. So it's a little bit of a game of cat and mouse where you wouldn't want your patients, your your patients, you wouldn't want your employees, your plan members seeing a physician that is financially incentivized to prescribe a medication or a brand name medication. Like you wouldn't want that, okay? Next up, a misalignment of cancer doctors. So US oncology, um, sorry, same slide, just different bullet. If you can go back, please. So US oncology is the largest oncology practice in America. America. Okay, you have many U.S. oncology practices in North Carolina. They're not called U.S. oncology. U.S. oncology. They have just a local name on the front of the building. Okay, but U.S. oncology isn't even its own entity. It's owned by McKesson. McKesson's a Fortune 10 company. Many of you are probably familiar with it. What does McKesson do? They're a, a drug wholesaler. They're a hospital supply wholesaler. Okay, so you mean to tell me that 
one of the nation's 10 largest companies and a wholesaler of chemotherapy owns the largest physician group for cancer in America? Yes. What does that mean? That means that the more chemo the U.S. oncology doctors prescribe, the more money McKesson makes because they get the throughput on their wholesaling of the chemo. Now, I don't know what the specific compensation structure looks like for those oncologists, but there is, there is an inherent conflict of interest in that business model for the overprescription of chemotherapy. Now, so that's an example of a wholesaler owning physicians. Now, the third point is actually just the opposite. There are physicians that own wholesalers. They're called physician-owned distributors. They're typically owned by surgeons where uh, they distribute, let's say, the orthopedist will own a quote unquote distributing company for knee and hip implants. And when they do surgery at a hospital, they say to the hospital, you need to buy the hip and knee implants that I use from the distributor that I own. So not only is the physician getting their professional fees for doing the surgery, but they're also getting the, the throughput and the margin off of being the wholesaler for the knee itself. Okay, so again, there, there, there is a, there's a conflict of interest where they are being incentivized to maybe do more knee or hip implants or spine surgeries than they would if they weren't being financially compensated in that way. Okay, next slide, please. So those are just a handful example of doctor misalignment, okay? Now, let's go through hospital misalignment. So. Hospital outpatient department imaging and uh, and out, hospital outpatient departments and imaging center pricing. So many of you probably pretty astute, and you probably know that getting having your employees and your plan members get services at a hospital is very expensive. And so oftentimes you say, okay, well maybe if you have it done at an independent imaging center or at a separate outpatient facility, like just at the cardiologist's office, that that will be more uh, cost effective. But here's what the hospital systems have done: they have gone out and they have bought these cardiology practices, for example, and they have bought the imaging centers. Again, they don't change the name on the front of it. So you think you're going to ABC Cardiology Clinic or XYZ Imaging Center, but in fact, because the hospital owns it, they are then able to bill Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, whatever insurance company you have, through their tax ID. And the tax ID is their sort of unique identifier for being reimbursed at the higher hospital rate. So you think you're going to X, you know, ABC cardiology clinic for an echocardiogram and you will be charged a hospital facility fee for that echocardiogram. And we've literally had people when they got an echocardiogram one year and the facility fee was $120. And they went back the next year to the exact same clinic, exact same sign on the front, exact same doctor. And their facility fee became $800 because the hospital had bought it and then was running it through their contract with let's say Blue Cross. And again, they have much more uh, bargaining power with Blue Cross. So they're able to get much higher reimbursement than just an individual physician practice. Same thing with the imaging center or the independent imaging center, maybe the CT scan or the MRI was only $450 for the facility fee. But then when it's bought by the hospital, that could go up uh, five times or more to $2,500, $3,000 for that facility fee. Okay, so there it's hidden, right? So there you think you're doing the good thing by going to a non-hospital facility when in fact you still are unbeknownst to you. Okay, next up, Hospital uh, Ambulatory Surgery Center Physician Group Joint Ventures. So here, the again, Many uh, employers and employees who are astute are like, well, let's not get surgery done at the hospital. Let's get it done at the ambulatory surgery center because we know it'll be more cost effective. It'll have lower uh, infection rates, right? Because you don't, you only have healthy people going to these ASCs. You don't have people with infections getting their you know, appendicitis taken out. And so what they've done, these hospital systems, is they've entered into joint ventures with the physicians, specifically the surgeons or the OBGYNs or the ENTs, sometimes the gastroenterologists, where the doctors own 49% of the surgery center and the hospital owns 51% of the surgery center. Now, why do they do that? Well, the physician wants to do it because they will not only get their professional fee for performing the surgery, let's say an, an orthopedist is scoping a knee, 
where they'll get $800 for scoping the knee. But then they'll also get the facility fee. They'll get 49% of the facility fee. And that facility fee, even at an ambulatory surgery center, could be like $16,000. So they're going to get just under eight grand for the facility fee. Now, the hospital will get 51% of that. Now, why does, again, similar to the imaging center and the cardiology practice, the reason that the hospital owns 51% of it is because then they can run it through the hospital's more aggressive contracts with the insurance company, the much higher reimbursement. The individual surgeon and individual ambulatory surgery center could never get that sort of deal, but the hospital system can get a very good deal from the insurance company. So everybody wins. The hospital gets more patient flow through that ASC because the physician's financially incentivized to have it go through the ASC and the physician wins because they get to collect on the facility fees and not just their professional fees. Okay. Next up. And again, doesn't necessarily even say the hospital system on the front of the ambulatory surgery center. You could be going to blue bonnet surgery center and it's actually owned by the hospital system. Uh, finally, and this actually hits very close to home there in North Carolina. Hospital systems are blocking the free patient referral patterns of employee doctors there. So this happened with the atrium hospital system in Charlotte, where they were buying a whole bunch of physician practices, and then they would tell the physicians, you have to refer your patients to our hospital for imaging and tests and for other specialists. They would tell the primary care, you think, oh, I'm going to a primary care physician. This is great, right? But then the primary care physician would be required or quote unquote strongly encouraged to only refer patients to the hospital system's own doctors. Well, what if the primary care physician didn't want to do that? Maybe they had a better experience with a specialist that was not a part of that hospital system, right? And so that's where the Tryon Medical Group there in the Charlotte area said, well, listen, we want to be able to refer our patients without some hospital system telling us what to do. And so they left and they are now independent. And so really hats off to Tryon for doing that. They said, look, doing what's best for our patient is more important than what's doing what's best for a hospital administrator. So just know that not every physician group in North Carolina has done what Tryon's done. And if they're owned by the hospital, they're either forced or strongly encouraged to make all of their referrals be inside that hospital system. Okay, next slide. I'm going to move kind of rapidly through these next ones. So you think, okay, that's fine. Those are the doctors in the hospitals. Your own health insurance company is misaligned with you as well, okay? So you basically need to ignore PPO discounts. So the discount off the bill charges that you get through your PPO network is, is based off fictitious bill charges, okay? The prices that the hospitals use that you quote unquote get a discount off of, they are completely made up. What do I mean by weight? Oh, by the way, they don't use the word fictitious. They call it strategic pricing, which they have something called a charge master, which is the list of all the prices of everything, a $5 a pill of Tylenol, a $150 bag of IV fluids, and that charge master is specifically tailored to maximize their reimbursement. It's not based upon any actual true understanding of their costs. Why is that? Okay, this is probably the second most important thing for you to understand from my talk. Hospitals, by and large, do not do cost accounting. They don't know what it costs them to do a gallbladder surgery. They don't know what a 30-minute stay or visit to the emergency room costs them. They don't know. Therefore, they cannot base their prices on their costs. Let's say they want to have a 10% margin or even a 50% margin for that particular test or procedure. They don't know. They have no idea. There's only a handful of hospitals in America that actually do cost accounting. The University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Geisinger in Pennsylvania, um, the University of Utah in Utah, the Intermountain Healthcare System in Utah. In fact, when the University of Utah put in cost accounting and they actually figured out what each one of their individual services cost, Michael Porter, one of the most famous business school professors in the world from Harvard Business School, got on a plane and went to Utah. And it's like, what is this amazing innovation you have here at the University of Utah? And their CEO, Vivian Lee, was like, yeah, it's called cost accounting. Like every other business in America does it except for hospitals. It was such a big story. It was, on, it was in the New York Times, okay? So imagine if you ran your business without cost accounting, right? You wouldn't be able to effectively run your business. So hospitals, 
base their prices on some sort of fictitious number. And then the insurance company, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, gives you a quote unquote discount off of a fictitious price. So that's where you don't care about discounts. That quote unquote discount is not true savings. All you cared about, all you care about is the true cost, which is called the allowed amount, which is what you pay or your plan pays after the discount is applied. Okay, so fine, along those lines, you might've heard this term like value-based care. And all that is, is it's still 90% of the same shenanigans that I just described. And it's a little 10% kicker of, um, okay, well, if you have lower readmission rates, we'll give you a, a, a little quality bonus. Okay, so it's not value-based. It's more like uh, a, a value candle on the fee-for-service cake. Okay, so it's still that PPO discount shenanigans is 90% of what you're paying. So when anybody says to you value-based care, you'd be like, okay, fine, show me your contract, show me the proof, you're right, trust but verify. And of course they won't show you, but that's where, and, and a, the CEO of Blue Cross of Arizona like admitted to this on a YouTube video. So I'll, I'll leave a link that you guys can look at, but, but she's like, look, we all brag about this 90% value-based care, uh, but it, it's not, it's just fee-for-service. Uh, finally, um, so some insurance carriers are so brazen that United Healthcare actually owns a consulting firm called the Advisory Board Company that actually consults hospitals on how to make more money from employers. So here they are on one side of their business telling employers, we're trying to save you money. And they have another side of their business that goes to hospitals and tells them, hey, let us tell you all the tricks that you can use to make more money from employers. And United Healthcare is actually fairly open about it. And you know why they're so open about it? Because they can, because they're so big that they can. All right, final slide, and then I will pass it over to Bruce. And that is PBMs. Okay, so here, again, they have a quote unquote fictitious price that they call AWP, and the pharmacy benefit manager has quote unquote negotiated you a discount off of AWP, and they get you like an 80% discount off AWP. And you're like, oh, that's amazing, an 80% discount. But what they don't tell you is that the 20% that's left is still a 20 times markup of what the generic medication actually costs. So now keep in mind, again, many of you are using Blue Cross of North Carolina. Blue Cross of North Carolina uses a PBM called Prime Therapeutics, which by the way, is actually owned by various Blue Cross plans. Okay, the two largest PBMs in America are Express Scripts, which is owned by Cigna, and CVS Caremark, which now owns Aetna. Now, uh, Prime Therapeutics doesn't even negotiate their own pricing. They have outsourced that to Express Scripts. So all Prime Therapeutics does is they handle the enrollment and the formulary and yada, yada, yada. They don't even do it. I mean, it's like Target using Walmart to negotiate their purchasing. Right, so here you have two quote unquote competing PBMs and Prime is basically throwing up their hands and are like, look, we're just gonna pay a fee to Express Scripts and they're just gonna do all the, negoti all the negotiating for us, okay? I'm gonna skip the Sure Scripts one for the sake of time. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, is that sometimes you'll hear the term rebates when it comes to pharmacy benefit manager. Okay, there is no rebate in rebate, it's just a commission. The PBM is paid a commission by the pharmaceutical company for selling brand name medications. So what does a commission do to a salesperson? Many of you have salespeople that are on commission in your businesses. Those commissions are structured to incentivize the salespeople to sell more and to sell higher priced items. And that's exactly what the pharmaceutical companies do when they pay these commissions to PBMs. So with that, you're gonna hear wonderful speakers today They're gonna that are gonna talk about some of these issues and many more in much greater detail and clarity than what I just did. But I just, but but go to the, the final slide is, look, all of you just need to be careful, okay? All of you need to be careful. You need to think, and by the way, this picture's from my front door. So that's my image out of my front door. Welcome to my home, okay? <laughs> so you need to look for people that have aligned incentives. And the very first conversation you need to have with every single vendor is, let me go through Dr. Bricker's slides and talk about how you are or are not aligned with my own incentives as a business, okay? You have to take matters into your own hands, okay? Do not be passive, you have to be active, okay? And that includes with your own employees. So we've talked a lot about vendors, but this also includes aligning incentive with, incentives with your employees. And with that, I will pass the floor back to Bruce 
thank you all so much for being here today and for listening. Dr. Bricker, that was a great introduction to this uh, conference. And I've got a couple things I'd like to ask you if you can hang with us for a few minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm a rehab employment lawyer, not an antitrust lawyer, but I this really... Oh my goodness. I take back yeah. everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> but this really smells and feels like uh, I smell antitrust. I smell government uh, legislative protection. I smell lobbying and statutes and, you know, protection of contracts. I, I smell all that. Am I smelling that right? Uh, you have. And in fact, um, Blue Cross, the, the nationwide association, has actually been just recently um, uh had, had a major lawsuit where they're, they're going to have to pay. Some of you as businesses might be receiving checks because they have to pay uh, all the Blue Cross plans have to pay $7.2 billion out to their customers for their uh, anti-competitive, uh, antitrust uh, activities. Here is the punchline of that story. That antitrust uh, suit was, bought, was brought by the customers of Blue Cross itself. It was not brought by the Justice Department. Right. So who's the watchdog? What's going on? Why did the customers of Blue Cross have to sue their own vendor for antitrust purposes? Where was the Justice Department? This suit has been going on for seven years. This suit was going on under the Obama administration. The suit was going on under the Trump administration. Where was the Justice Department? And so the revolving door of lobbyists in Washington, D.C., who spends more money than the Department of Defense or any other industry? The healthcare industry and the health insurance industry spends more money on lobbying than any other industry. And it's not even the pharmaceutical side. It's the hospital side and the insurance company side as Mayor AHIP, America's health insurance plans. So we'd like to think that we have a watchdog watching out for us. But again, like the reason that I had that slide, like you've got, you've got to take matters into your own hands. Okay, caveat emptor, buyer beware. You know, I've got a really good friend that's a, a really has been historically uh, he's retired now, but a really good broker in the community, uh, group health broker, really well regarded. And he used to tell me, uh, you know, carrier A has a better discount than carrier B, right? That just what you mentioned earlier to me today. I now know that's that might be true, but it's still it's useless. <laughs> right. And that uh, that the, that the more important thing, perhaps, in the PPO world is that the PPO contract requires the hospital requires the carrier to take it all or nothing. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. Can you speak to that point? Yeah. So again, this is this relates to a court case out in California um, against there. They have a huge healthcare system in San Francisco called Sutter Health. And it's in Sacramento as well, where what the hospital says is if we are in network, then all of our facilities and all of our physicians are in network. And so, you're, you know, Blue Cross United Signa Edna, they have data on the physicians and on the hospitals. And so they know that there might be some facilities that have higher infection rates, that there might be some physicians that have worse outcomes. And you as an employer and the insurance company, might want to make them out of network. And the contract that the hospital system makes the insurance company sign says, you can't do that. You can't cherry pick our good physicians versus our bad physicians. You can't cherry pick our good facilities versus our bad facilities. And Sutter got in trouble with the state of California. So Becerra, who's now the, the head of the Department of Health and Human Services, when he was that position for the state of California, he sued Sutter and he won. And he said that is an anti-competitive practice by the hospital that all or no, because you as and so by the way, you as an employer, you can actually do this. And this is actually what Walmart has done. So Walmart actually want to do that. They're like, hey, we want to steer our employees to the better doctors and the better hospitals. And literally their insurance carriers said no to them. The largest employer in America was told by their insurance carriers, no, which just shows you the power of those contracts that the hospitals have with the insurance care. So Walmart said, forget it, we're gonna do it ourselves. So th they created their own price and quality transparency tool for the employees. And they're like, there's nothing in those contracts that says that we as an employer can't do this. So they actually started scoring and grading and changing their benefit plan design such that if the Walmart employees went to certain physicians in network, 
that they got lower copays and lower deductibles because their insurance carriers could not do that contractually. So that's probably more than you want to know, but that's what Bruce is getting at when he talks about those all or nothing contracts. Well, and that and that's really what, you know, pieces of that is what we're going to be talking about later today, what your options are as a smaller employer to do something similar, something close to what Walmart did. You know, I, it occurs to me, why why would a large carrier, and there, you know, there's several large carriers, we'll have to pick on one carrier. Why would a large carrier not use its market power, its flow of customers, its book of business, to change some of this what's what, what why do you think that is so so the short answer is is that they do and there are several states where the blue cross plans are the absolute 800 pound gorillas and certainly north carolina is one of those blue cross of blue cross of north carolina is the 800 pound gorilla there's other states like that too so the blue cross plan in florida is called florida blue they're the 800 pound gorilla Arkansas, Blue Cross of Arkansas is the 800 pound gorilla. Blue Cross of Michigan is the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, and so what you get is a quote unquote lower unit cost. So if you went with an Aetna or Cigna or maybe even a United, especially in rural areas, your discount is probably not going to be as good as that Blue Cross discount. But remember, the healthcare cost equation is two parts. It's the cost per unit, which is the quote unquote discount, but then it's also the number of units. And so again, there's been a little bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, where the hospital's like, okay, fine, we'll give you this, you know, this discount. But if you were going to give you such a big discount, then you better make sure you give us some patient volume, right? Because that's the whole leverage of Blue Cross in North Carolina, is they say, we have all this, all this patient volume that we can send your way. They're like, well, fine. You better not get in the way of that patient volume. Your prior authorizations better not be too strict. You you better not have too many denials. So th this is true of every insurance carrier. They talk about how strict they are with their prior authorizations and their denials and et cetera, et cetera, to you, the employer. But to the insur to but to the doctors in the hospitals, they actually talk the exact opposite talk. Oh no, we'll deliver a lot of patients to you. You give us this great uh, discount, and we'll give you a ton of patient lives. We'll give you a con a ton of care volume. And so that's where you cannot live by the quote unquote discount alone. You have to look at, right? The, the estimate is that 30% of care in America is waste because it's unnecessary. Okay, so the point is, is that many, this is not, this is not a Dr. Eric Bricker statistic. This is an Institute of Medicine statistics from doctors themselves. So some of the most reputable doctors themselves in America with the Institute of Medicine have, sa have said this, and it's been known for 15, 20 plus years. So the question becomes your overall strategy. And by the way, forget about the money. Subjecting your employees and your plan members to unnecessary medical care it, uh, creates something called iatrogenesis, which is harm caused by healthcare testing and procedures itself. And every single doctor in, in hospital knows whether it be a hospital acquired infection, or one of the things is, is that you do a scan and you find some sort of incidental nodule on somebody's lung and you're like, oh man, now I got to go do a biopsy on their lung. And when you biopsy their lung, you risk popping a hole in their lung and giving them what's called a pneumothorax, where that little spot on their lung was maybe where they had a little uh, fungal lung infection when they were like eight years old and it cleared up and it's just a scar. But you can't tell that on the CT scan. You have to take a biopsy. I literally, in medical school, I literally saw a woman in Chicago who was going to have thyroid surgery. And what did she get? She got a cardiac stress test beforehand. She should have never gotten that cardiac stress test. Thyroid surgery is incredibly low risk. You don't need to do a stress test beforehand. They did the stress test. They saw a small abnormality on that stress test. They said, well, we have to investigate it. She got a cardiac catheterization. and she ended up getting a stroke during the cardiac catheterization. She never got her thyroid surgery because she ended up in the ICU. Now, I'm not trying to use scare tactics. It's obviously a very extreme example. But the point is, is that when physicians and hospitals give informed consent, oftentimes they sort of minimize the actual risk of doing the test or procedure. And Every doctor themselves, when they go in and get care, they know, look, this has, and like, you know, when I talk to my fellow physicians, I'm like, do I really need to get this done? And, you know, classic example is heartburn. Do I really need to get an upper endoscopy when I have heartburn? Can't I just take Prilosec 
And if it gets better, then I don't need the upper endoscopy. You know what their answer is? Yeah, just take the Prilosec. And if it gets better, you don't need the upper endoscopy. Okay, so um, long-winded answer to your question. But the point is, is that you need to, listen, all of you are smart, right? You're the CEOs of companies. If there is one book that you read, it is called The Company That Solved Healthcare by John Tornis. He is a CEO of Serograph. They make dashboards for trucks and cars. They're based in Wisconsin, and they are about 1,000 employees, all-American company. They make their stuff here in America. And John Tornis was like, I've had enough. And they have kept their healthcare costs flat for over 10 years. I bet you all of you wish your healthcare costs were flat for 10 years. I bet you you wish you were paying what you were 10 years ago for healthcare. And he wrote the book, The Company That Solved Healthcare. And he can tell you exactly how he did it from a CEO's perspective. And you're going to love it because it's written like a CEO would write a book. First you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And then people complain, and then you keep moving forward, right? I mean, you'll totally get it when you read this book. That is so cool. And, and that may segue us on out here, Dr. Brecker, in your segment is – with all this misalignment, you've done an excellent job describing this misalignment, and I certainly encourage folks to go to ahealthcarec.com or YouTube and search ahealthcarec or your name and watch your videos because they're just super instructive. Each video is short. Uh, it's in front of your classic whiteboard. You do a good job explaining a complex topic in a short uh, fashion. With all that, with all that known and all that said, just give us your last recommendations on what you recommend an employer to do about this misalignment, if they can, if they can find a way to self-insure. What do you recommend that they do, and what approach to take? So you don't have to boil the ocean, and this holds true if you're a company with 50 employees or 200 employees, then you're fully insured, or if you're uh, if you're self-funded. It doesn't matter if you're rural or urban. It doesn't matter if you have a high turnover company or a low turnover company. The point is is that you need to pick specific areas for change based upon the type of company that you are. So not all solutions work for all companies. Let me give you an example. For a company with, uh, uh, or a municipality with a large number of employees, large, it only has to be like 200 to 500 employees. It doesn't have to be huge, okay? And you have those employees in one location. Probably one of the smartest things you can do is have a near site or an on-site clinic where you have either a, a physician or a nurse practitioner who is taking care of your employees. That's one of the things that John Tornis did. I mean, it is so smart now. If you have a company with high turnover or where your employees are spread out, whether it's across the state of North Carolina or across the country, like that's a horrible idea. You should never do that. So what are there are other things that you would want to do, whether it be with telemedicine, whether it be with better access uh, to, to data by self-funding, like it might make more sense for you to self-fund because your employees are spread out and it might make more sense for you to use a TPA and it might sense for you to have um, tighter rules that Blue Cross can't do, but an independent TPA can do. If you, listen, in Texas, they self-fund down to 50 employees all the time. Our record is 35. They're the temp agency. Imagine the kind of turnover a temp agency has. Temp agency, 35 employees self-funded. So and they, many, 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 many employers in Texas, 85 to 150 employees, they self-fund all the time. Now, total plan members, you typically double it, right? So you're talking like 170 to 300 plan members. But my point is, is that you need to sit down with HR, CFO, whoever your trusted advisor is, broker benefit consultants, there are many good ones out there. And you need to think about what is a specific plan for your company and what can you, and you don't boil the ocean. What can you do this year? And then what can you do the next year? And it took John Torrance 10 years to do this, okay? So you're not gonna do it overnight, okay? But you're gonna baby step it in. And if you slowly make progress, you will win. This is a solvable mm -hmm. problem. It is, it, is sol it is not a black box. This is a solvable problem. Dr. Bricker, I want you to go tell your wife that I said you are a national treasure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she won't believe you. <laughs> no, no, and she shouldn't. Don't tell her I'm a rehab lawyer, okay? And we appreciate you so much being with us here today. And uh, take care of your kids and do what you need to do. And thank you for carving out this time for us. Listen, thank you to all of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.
Great. Thank you so much. The chat is full of uh, love for you, Dr. Bricker. So you made a good impact so far. So thank you so much. A lot of high fives and yeses, and it's about time somebody said this. So uh, there you go. Thank you so much. OK, so we're going to pivot now into, a, a, I think, a, a segment that's going to that might make you a little mad. Um, we, we shall see. These are we did. A, we spent I spent uh, the last uh, month or two videotaping uh, a, a group of, of people in the industry. So these are providers, doctors, uh, these are, are brokers, these are uh, insurance experts, these are in fact employers. And the title of this, I believe, is something like Outrageous Stories. And so we're going to share these with you. I'll have some comments at the end. But again, our mission here in kind of the morning section here is in fact to, I think, I think raise our blood pressure a little bit. Because I think there's a malaise that kind of exists here. I saw some comments around, well, I guess we're just out of luck, right? There's no solutions for us small employers. And there are. But I think we've kind of been trained over the last 15, 20 years, my entire career, 30 years now. I've been, kind of, it is what it is. The best you can do is just change carriers and try to make it better. Uh, there are solutions out there, which we're going to pivot to uh, in an hour or so. But first, I want to give you some just some examples that will make your head spin. These are real examples. These are not extreme examples. Each person I talked to had 15 to 20 examples on the top of their head with their patients or their plan or their employers. So these are things that happen every day for those employers that are either fully insured or level funded or, again, tied to a carrier for for in some way for their self-insured product. So with that, I'm going to ask them to roll the tape and I'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. So enjoy. Hi, my name is Richard Dunn. I'm president of Preferred Health Plan of the Carolinas. We're a TPA, third party administrator in Charlotte, and uh, we process, adjudicate claims for self-funded health plans. So I've been asked to give you an example of some outrageous claims. Well, I have one sitting on my desk for an end-stage renal disease for dialysis. And this is a client that we inherited fully insured and we get a claim for his visits to dialysis and it was $300,000 for dialysis. We moved this group over to self-funded uh, back in November. We started getting these claims and we said, we called up the uh, provider and we said, hey, this is a little outrageous. And with one phone call, we were able to get those claims down to $70,000 instead of the 300. I mean, go figure. It was one phone call, just a little investigating and asking for a, a bigger and a better discount. You can't do that from fully insured. You could only do it from being self-funded. My name is Vinay Patel. And I'm the pharmacist founder of MakeORx. And we're here to share just a few outrageous drug examples. So uh, this is a story about a common antibiotic you and many conference attendees have likely taken at some point, a Z-Pack. Under the status quo, the employer was billed $74 and the member paid $12. That's $86 or six tablets of a very common generic antibiotic. Uh, the member knows no different and happily pays his cost share. The employer is the one getting overcharged here. Uh, so real quick, Doug, take a quick guess at the cost of this drug to, to the pharmacy. So this drug costs $4, about $4 for the pharmacy to buy from their wholesaler uh, to, uh, to give to the member, to, to stock at the pharmacy. Now let's look at how this plays out through MakeRx uh, slash Hero Health, uh, which Hero Health is a local health, un a local unbundled health plan solution uh, for, for employers. Uh, and uh, so let's look at how this plays out under the MakeRx Hero Health model at a local pharmacy. The employer sees the actual drug cost, which is about $4, $3.37 to be exact, plus $8 paid to the pharmacy for the service. $11.37 is billed to the employer less any member cost share. That's it. 
That's all. Make RX only makes money on a per employee admin fee, never on the drug. And so we'll unpack what's going on here. The status quo PBM is setting the price of the drug and charging the inflated cost to the employer and paying the pharmacy closer to the actual drug cost to keep the spread. With Hero Health, the employer only gets charged the invoice drug price and the margin to the pharmacy. The drug price is never set by Mako RX. So uh, we'll go into one other example, uh, a generic birth control example. And this is, the chain, this is where chain pharmacies are, are setting the price here despite economies of scale. So a chain store for a generic birth control example that we've seen has uh, over $200 for this generic birth control medicine. The cost plus rate or the wholesale direct price is $88 for the same birth control, same exact medication, chain store versus a local hometown pharmacy at our cost plus rates. Chain stores are buying medications at deeply discounted rates, but the savings is rarely passed on to employer plans or members due to contract terms to include these large national stores and pharmacy networks. Um, th there is a price versus cost discrepancy in healthcare. I think you've had this theme uh, already shared previously the price you pay is rarely connected to the cost in anything in healthcare and even more so in pharmacies. Hero Health and MakerX want to change that. So please come back in the afternoon session at 1240 to learn more about Hero Health and MakerX, how, how Hero Health and MakerX are bending the cost curve. Hey, good morning. My name is Chris Schaffner, and I'm the founder and chief collaborator at Your Community Health Plan. And one of the most important things we were looking at in the development of this was how do we deal with drugs? Drug costs are growing in percentage of spend in a health plan up to about 25%. And one of the most amazing things we found out was that even in generics, you can have the system rigged against you. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at a typical PBM and you look at a typical health plan, everybody would say that if you're running at 90% generics, you're doing as good a job as you can, making sure people are using uh, adequately priced good generic meds. And what we found out in repricing over 200 different groups from seven different states was that, um, as you see on the slide, generic drugs, roughly ingredient costs plus dispensing fee, of $100,000. Under NADAC, which is the National Average Drug Acquisition Cost, the real cost of those ingredients is only about $46,000. So the difference between $100,000 and $46,000 is $54,000. Well, where is that money going? Well, it's not going to the pharmacy and it's not going to the plan. Uh, so when we found that out, we just kind of sat back and said, wow, if we are losing almost half of our money being spent on generic drugs, then we need to find something better um, than a typical PBM. And that's how we developed and worked with Mako RX on our, the NADAC model, which is a cost plus model. And as you can see on the slide, ingredient cost plus four, is 46,703 compared to 103,627. If we use an $8 dispensing fee, which now has a pharmacist as part of your care team doing care planning and maintenance and communication with the plan participant, even if the plan paid 100% of that additional $8 dispensing fee, the plan is still saving almost 18% over a typical PBM. And that's just on generic drugs. So for us, that was kind of an aha moment to say, wow, you can really game generics that much. Hi, I'm Christy Gupton. I'm president of Custom Benefit Solutions. I'm a member of the Health Rosetta and, and another group called Mitigate Partners. And we've spent an incredible amount of time helping employers understand the reality of um, insurer-built healthcare. Well, this story I have to share with you today is a bit of a, not just an eye opener, it's pretty upsetting. <laughs> and I, I hope that um, if this doesn't happen to you, but if it does, you have um, much greener pastures on the other side of this story. So um, I got called up 
one day out of the blue by um, a prospect and they invited me to coffee. And they said, we just, we just want to learn more. We, we follow what you put out there on LinkedIn and you put some stuff out there that's pretty interesting. So we want to talk to you because we have questions. We just don't understand why certain things are the way they are. We think you might know why. So I went and, and we had our coffee and it was fun. It, and, and they had all the normal complaints. Like we don't understand why things are priced certain ways and we're not sure why our employees aren't stopped by the carrier from going in one high price direction when a lower price direction is just down the street. So we talked and I explained, you know, reality. I, I sort of channeled my inner Dr. Eric Bricker and went into education mode, you know. I said, listen, you haven't hired me yet, so I'm not going to do this for you. But this is a little homework assignment, and it's easy enough. You can actually do it yourself. I said, first of all, you need to call your carrier. And a um, little background, this was already a self-funded employer, and they were on the smaller side, like 80, 90 employees, something like that. Um, and they were doing pretty good uh, as far as they could tell. Um, but they still just had a desire to do it better. Um, so anyway, I said, here's your homework assignment. Uh, call your carrier and ask for a claims run of last year's claims, but just on musculoskeletal. So don't get them alarmed just yet. Just, just make up some story that like you're doing a, a healthy lifting program or a, 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 a how, to, um, how to save your back kind of uh, kind of program and, and they'll believe you. So just ask for musculoskeletal just from last year, a claims uh, report for that only. So they did that and they and and I said, when you get that report, all the five figure numbers, the dollar numbers with five figures, those are procedures. And you can Google the diagnosis code associated with those five figure numbers. And you can find out what procedure it was, and then you'll see what your plan paid for those procedures. Second part of this homework assignment is go to the Surgery Center of Oklahoma's website and look at what they charge for the same exact procedures. And understand that your carrier told you that you would get a discount from them for the claims that they processed and the care that your employees received there but at Surgery Center of Oklahoma, they only take cash and there's no discount. So here's my prediction. And if I'm right, please invite me back for meeting number two because I have another homework assignment for you. So they did it. And I, I said, my prediction is your plan will have paid three times, 300% of the amount that you could have gotten just paying cash to Surgery Center of Oklahoma. So they did it, turned out I was right. They called me back and said, okay, we're ready for meeting number two. And I got there and I said, all right, this time let's talk about PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, the prescription drug benefit on your plan. I said, you need to call your carrier and ask for the contract. Tell them you want to read the contract between the carrier and the PBM that they selected, that they put you with. Because, of course, we all know by now that all carriers have chosen one PBM to do business with. And, and in three cases out of four, they own each other in some regard, right? So ask the carrier for your PBM, for their PBM contract, because you want to read it. And I said, spoiler alert, they're not going to show it to you. <laughs> and they will make up all kinds of excuses about proprietary information and whatnot. And I said, you should start getting very angry at that point because it is your money that is paying for the terms of the contract between the carrier and the PBM. And if they won't tell you why and how and under what terms your money is being spent on drugs, then you should get upset at that point. So I left it at that and we said our goodbyes and I didn't hear back from them for a few months, which is typical with a prospect, right? So then they called me back 
a couple months later and they said, um, we just have to share a, a story with you. It's pretty, it's pretty um, outrageous. We weren't expecting this. They said, but our carrier came for our quarterly review and they went through the reports and it was a casual, you know, somewhat um, nice conversation. And then at the end, they lowered the boom on us. They said, we've been somewhat uncomfortable with the questions you've been asking us lately. And so unfortunately, we are going to have to end your service agreement with us at the end of your plan year. Now, just let that sink in for a minute. Wow. A carrier is firing an employer. You guys have to wonder when, when and where has that ever happened before? And so basically what you need to know is this small self-funded employer was expendable by that to that carrier. They were worth getting rid of so that this employer didn't find out any more than they already knew. And so um, if you're an employer out there, I just want to encourage you to not pay the next bill without thinking twice about supporting and participating in a system that operates very much like a cartel. Hello, my name is Patrick Long and I'm founder and CEO of Hero Health Plans. Uh, we'll be meeting with you later today to go over some of the solutions to all these problems we're hearing about this morning. Um, but first, my outrages, uh, and there's many of them. Uh, I'll just share two with you this morning. Uh, the first is about information, uh, data. Um, the carriers, the Bucas, Blue, United, Cigna, Aetna, Humana, the Buca monsters, uh, they think your information is theirs to rent and sell and scrub and hide. Uh, that's outrageous to me that uh, you have to beg for your own information. Um, the other outrage related to that is they call themselves the payers. They're not paying anything. You're paying. Your employees are paying an extraordinary amount of money for access to care through their networks and your plan is paying an exorbitant amount year after year uh, and they have the gall to call themselves the payers you're the payer uh, your employees are the payer and that is your information it's not theirs to rent or sell or prevent you from seeing or acting upon so those are outrageous my other outrage has uh, been bubbling for many years now um, this came in the mail uh, I won't name the carrier, uh, but uh, they offered me and other brokers in North Carolina $50,000 bonuses to switch clients like you from self-funded, where you had control, back to fully insured, where they took back control from you. Uh, $50,000 bonus. Um, that should tell you something uh, about the what's at stake here. If you become self-funded, these carriers uh, get very angry because they're losing control. You're taking back control. So if you had over uh, 250 lives total um, in a group, uh, they would pay your broker $50,000 to switch you. Uh, that's outrageous. That's, uh, that's like the Sopranos, right? Um, uh, so anyway, um, I didn't switch anybody. I'm a big advocate of self-funding. I'm sure you are after you hear all this information, but those are my outrages. Thanks for letting me share. My name is Bill Ball, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Frank Bloom Construction Company. We are a privately held general contractor here in North Carolina with about 175 employees. Uh, we are also longtime members of Catapult through the CAI organization. Uh, like many of you listening today, we have been kicked around um, between buca plans for as long as anybody around here can remember. Uh, one example of how we are overpaying in that buca system is on the drug Humira. I'm sure you've heard about this drug. They, they advertise literally 24-7, 365. Um, we have one employee who has been prescribed this drug, and the cost to our plan was rising every year. And last year, the cost topped $130,000 to the plan. That was almost 10% of our total health care cost, just that one prescription. And importantly, our employee who was on a high deductible health plan 
was paying $6,400 out of his own pocket for that drug. So huge impact to the employee and huge impact to the employer. Our carrier and our broker, they never mentioned any solutions. They just paid the bill and then charged our employee and charged the plan. So fast forward to switching to Hero Health. Um, they, with the PBM, got the cost down in about two months by 30% just with transparent pricing. So big win, everybody's happy, <laughs> great. Um, did they stop there? No. Um, they began the process of applying for prescription assistance. To be honest, I didn't even know this existed. Uh, but Hero with the PBM guided our employee through the process of applying through the manufacturer for, for discounts, and he was granted those discounts. And so that process is going to save the plan almost $100,000. Think about that. $100,000 to the plan and equally as important, uh, the employees now coming out of pocket zero versus $6,400 a year. Um, you know, our, our, the carrier knew about this, knew about these programs, did nothing. Now we're being proactive and we're saving a lot of money in the process. Um, on a personal note, I've got a, per a story that impacted me personally. On Monday of this week, I needed an MRI for my shoulder. My doctor had prescribed or had ordered that uh, MRI to be done at Novant at the facility right across the street from his facility. Uh, and if I had done nothing, if we had been with Buca, I would have just gone across the street, had my MRI, I would have paid $1,400 out of pocket, and our plan would have been billed something as well. However, through the pre-certification process with uh, Hero, I got a call that said, hey, instead of, <laughs> instead of going to that facility, why don't you go to this, to this other facility that was literally a soft pitching wedge away from the facility that, that my doctor had sent me to. I parked in the same parking spot <laughs> to go to this facility. Um, end result of that was zero out-of-pocket cost to me and a much lower charge to, to our plan. So the lesson here for me is to get creative, partner with people who care about you and care about your employees, and save money doing it. Wow. Wow is all I can say. Wow, 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 wow. I mean, if you could have seen me during a lot of this, you'd have seen my head doing this and scratching it and hair getting uh, uh, just messed up. So I was, I was inc incredible. The, the, the follow-up story to Bill's story there, when he went to the radiology to have his MRI, as he's standing there at, you know, at the front desk, like we all do, uh, there's a delay. He's like, is there some problem? She's like, um, hold on, she's doing it. it, it is there some problem, ma'am? And she said, well, I gotta be honest with you. I, I don't believe the screen I'm reading. What's that? Well, it says that you've got a zero copay on this. That can't be true. He said, yeah, that is true under my plan. She's like, I work here and I have to pay a lot of money. What, what, what are you on? So, you're hearing some terms thrown around now, hero, and there are solutions. Again, that's coming. Uh, we're going to, uh, we've got about an hour and then we're going to pivot uh, towards there are solutions here. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it's important. I've got two minutes here, but, you know, employers in this country insure anywhere from 55 to 62 percent of Americans get their insurance through an employer. And so it's a reasonable question after hearing Dr. Bricker. And hearing these videos, a reasonable question is, well, who's looking out for employers and employees? And it just feels like the system right now is, is not. Um, you know, you ask your question, why is that? Dr. Bricker, uh, I think, hit this perfectly. And Dave Chase will in, in about, an, about an hour. The misaligned incentives, you're just too much uh, invested in this for it to stay the same. Uh, I think there's a malaise that exists. We all have vendors in our life. I'm not going to mention names, but uh, vendors in our life of things we we sit down on the couch and watch, and things we hold in our hand. Let's just say that we just believe that's just the best it is, and there just aren't better alternatives out there. And so I'm going to suffer along with everybody else in this current healthcare system. And you know, you look at national surveys show that most employees are satisfied with their healthcare plans, despite that. I just don't think a lot of employees and for that matter, employers believe there's a better option out there. Um, and so again, our goal this morning was to make you a little mad, 
but stay tuned. Hope is there. There are solutions around the country that have been working for years now uh, that people like Eric Bricker and Dave Chase have been champion and they're now available here in North Carolina. So we'll talk more about those um, coming up shortly. But then great video session. I hope you enjoy that as much as I did. Uh, we're right on time, which is always the, 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 the sign of a good host, right? Stay on time. We're going to take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, we're going to hear the HR side of this, the HR talent side of this, which is also an important dimension here. So again, come back at, uh, let me see here, 10, 20, and we will start again. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, welcome back. I know you, you didn't uh, join this conference just to see me, so I'll keep my comments brief. We're now gonna pivot into the HR side. We have a very diverse audience. About half our audience will be business leaders and executives and the other half are in HR. And so it's important for us to get the HR uh, angle here and, and trying to engage HR in this conversation. They're an important, important partner here. I'm happy to introduce two great presenters here, Allie Hullowin who is, uh, again, a, a, a national thought leader. She's, she's had a, a foot in both camps. She worked in HR for many years, and now she helps companies to implement uh, proactive practices. So she's kind of seen both sides of the fence and looks like from her bio here, like Dave Chase, she's an adrenaline junkie. Looks like I see a uh, trail running, skiing, spinning, throwing weights around. And then also introduced from Catapult, Molly Hegeman, our chief strategy officer. Molly, like me, we call ourselves experienced HR professionals, right? We don't like the number that goes with our, our careers anymore. So Molly is an experienced total awards professional. And so I'm going to kick it to both of them and have a great session on the HR impact here. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Yes, yeah, so when you get to a certain age, it's just always better to say season or experience. <laughs> and so I'm happy to be here bringing many years of uh, experience with healthcare and this very important topic. And so, Ali, I would like to welcome you, and I'm just gonna give a little bit of a bio. Doug, Doug took a little of the fun away from your adrenaline junkie stuff, but so that everybody understands, as we're building out this agenda, we're bringing in experts to really try and help us all understand that we're, one, similar experiences, and two, uh, don't be satisfied with where we are in, in the form of true issues in healthcare. And, there are experts out there who can help us with this. And so Ali has uh, been able to join us this morning uh, from as, as far away as Montana, if I'm not correct. Is that right? That's where you yeah. are, Ali? Yeah, out in Bozeman. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So Ali spent over a decade working as an HR executive and truly enjoys total rewards. She, she developed a data-driven wellness program from the ground up led the team that took the company from a fully funded health plan to a self-funded health plan. Since her time in HR, Ali has worked with provider offices in developing business practices, the best kind. Ali today can be found passionately working with WebTPA as an account exec, helping companies to move to more proactive. So on both sides of the equation, we've got the HR as well as on the healthcare side. Outside of work, Allie is located in Bozeman, Montana with her husband and their two young kids. And she can be found collecting thoughts while trail running, cross country skiing, spinning, and throwing some weights around as Doug referenced. And again, my name is Molly. I am the strategic uh, Chief Strategic Officer at uh, Catapult. And our session today is really intended to give some perspective from the HR world uh, to help the CEOs and certainly those HR professionals on the call. So let's start with, Ali, your background. You've, you've seen it from both sides. Help us understand maybe what you would share with employers about how you might recommend making the plans more effective. What, what drives you to you, through your career? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a big question. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that this doesn't happen, but it is, you know, we're, it's 820 here and my kids are upstairs and they may barge in um, before they go to school. So um, just true. No, no worries. No worries. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the world. Yes. Of the yes. Pandemic and uh, managing, yeah. managing your work and uh, home at the same time in the same space. Yeah. So no worries there. Yeah, and they, they have no regard. We call them relentless. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, I think being on both sides it has been incredibly eye opening. I, I also, you know, where I was, I was leading the HR um, team was at a, a software company that 
um, adjudicated the, or created the software to adjudicate claims. Um, and so we really were, you know, I've, I've been in this industry from HR to the, the organization that I was at um, was really in the belly of the beast of, you know, TPAs and self-administered plans. Um, and so, you know, I would sit in a lot of our change control board meetings and talk about, you know, the requirements that these groups were coming up with, with what they wanted to do and where healthcare was going. And the software really is a key piece into how to make that happen. Um, and so, you know, that's just kind of been my second language for most of my life. <laughs> um, but, you know, really what it comes down to is as you're looking to innovate your health plans and you're looking to, you know, engage employees and retain employees, um, you, you really have, have got to look at um, being creative in the communication. Um, you know, your second largest expense most of the time is healthcare. And that's not the, you know, wellness checks and the, you know, the immunizations on occasion. This is the knee replacements and, uh, you know, the, the heart issues, all of that. And really looking at those big ticket items and, and taking that, you know, top percentage and finding a way to, you know, bundle those payments, have relationships, you know, this you'll hear probably Dave talk about this too, you know, that community owned or community based healthcare, you know, groups where you're going out into your community and you're saying, look, we're an employer, we're, we're all contributing here to this community in our own way. If my, you know, employee needs to, you know, has a heart attack or needs open heart surgery, you know, any of that, this is the expense to my company and the you know what can we do to be able to help each other to help build and grow our community um anymore that's really the language that's expected i think i think we're seeing a huge transition in general you've got you know i know i think part of this discussion is sorry i cut my finger this morning and it's um yeah so <laughs> um you're getting the real life alley view here today um so the you know the, the the language and and you've got this you know generational shift happening you know you you have people who are showing up that don't want to just show up and work every day they want to be part of something better and bigger and they want to know why they don't want to just be handed their insurance card and said this is what you you can use um, that we want to question why we're getting that insurance or you know if we know that we need to get you know major surgery done and our employer says you can go over here and it's going to be a lot cheaper not just it's going to help the bottom line of the company but how what's the impact across the board what's the footprint of that decision um and that's a lot of the conversations that are starting to be had right now um and the expectation of what where this needs to go um so how do you help how do you help make that shift ally because i think so much of what we've done over the course of time right is is really talk about the bills or the expense of it, but not as much about the behavior. Um, I, I've been doing this, as Doug said, for a long time. And I mean, I can think of coming out of indemnity plans to HMOs and what was the shift in the education then. So yeah. this, this is yet another version of that. Um, yes. There is a piece that's about the individual and what's going to cost them. Mm -hmm. But there's, you're referencing, we, we've heard Dr. Bricker reference, like there's something about the company as well. So talk to us a little bit. What's your advice yes. to HR professionals, to the uh, executives on the line? How do you start shifting in that in that yeah. direction? Yeah, I think that, you know, we, we, you, you see this a lot across organizations. You've got this, you know, the business speak, you know, like the KPIs and, you know, what, what how are we measuring our success? Um, and really starting there and saying, OK, what is, you know, what is our goal for savings and our, you know, and figuring out what that is, but not just what is the goal for savings, but what are we going to do with that savings? What kind of benefits can we bring in that will benefit our employees that can enhance their experience and retain them? Um, you know, we see that the average employee anymore is staying between 2.5 and three years. Well, a lot of that is because there's, there's innovation happening somewhere else, or, you know, the adage is kind of true. You leave and you come back and you get better pay. And so understanding, you know, looking at your employees as your community, setting those goals to how you're going to help your community, not just we want to save, you know, four million on our spend this year. OK, well, why? What's what's the point of that? So you set the KPI, but then you go, we're going to add in benefit programs like a sabbatical. You've been here for three years. You get a one month sabbatical and we will help and we will help fund that sabbatical and that you're seeing that across the board. It's happening more and more. It's becoming the expectation. But how do organizations afford to do that? 
how mm -hmm. how are they able to say you're a key player but you're going to take a month off um how are we going to support that so we we're going to take this, the month off we're going to help fund that and then maybe help out the people who are covering your load while you're gone and we're able to do that through savings of our health care you're still going to get great outcomes because we're going to be an outcome-based organization we are going to have these savings and then we're going to pour this back into our community every three years if you get a sabbatical i'll tell you what people are going to stay <laughs> so coming from a very tired mom <laughs> i will tell you if i had just had a month to clean my house um but it's you know i just think set looking at it and shifting from what's our bottom line and shifting that to the discussion of what how is our community being impacted and the community is are your employees their families and then the community surrounding you that's helping support you um, and that truly takes it, it does take a mindset shift i think any C, cfo that is listening right now probably would be like <laughs> was a little panicked by that but it, it, it's it's looking at this from a human approach rather than just a number approach so what i'm really hearing you say is there's two parts to it there's certainly the business side of it where there is hard yep. costs to be saved yes. but there's also from a total rewards perspective yep. there's a different desire do you feel like that is uh, more with different generations in the workplace, uh, younger generations looking for that? Do you see it across the board? What's your perspective there? Um, I think it's one of those that the younger generations, you know, you've got the millennials that are, are coming in. We're coming in at, you know, a little over 50% of the workforce right now. It's going to continue to grow, move into leadership positions pretty fast. You know, we've, we've had these discussions before about the lack of succession planning going on. Um, I think initially we're, we're kind of the ones making the rumblings and, and being vocal about it, but it's not because we're the first generation to want it. I think that um, we've watched our parents and we've watched their, and they watch their parents. Changes have been made through time. Um, and it's just like anything else. One generation paves the way for the next generation. Um, and you just have us stepping in and saying, we've got dual income homes we are you know we want to be able to stay and retain and not go through the stress of changing jobs but ultimately we're going to go where it's best for our family and for ourselves and here's the demands that we have for that it's not an entitlement it's just the only way to make the change is to have that shift and to have a little bit of that dramatic effect of we're leaving mm -hmm. you know and <laughs> go ahead and backfill spend a year backfilling and then they're going to leave and so it's you can't really make a shift without that disruption and so but it's not necessary i mean i think our generation and then the generation you know that's that's coming up behind us um these are demands that are coming in not because we are you know the first ones to think of it i think it's just that the the, the, the way has been paved for years and now this is just the next step and we are vocal enough to to demand it so if you're if you're talking specifically to an HR professional, how how do you you know if we all agree you know those people who are on the line are like yeah I mean I I, I buy into this I know that it's 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 broken it needs to be fixed I'm I'm willing to do my part to help innovate and, and disrupt but I'm not so sure exactly how do I do that like who what what advice do you have there to be able to say let's start talking about these kinds of things in the organization to get a yep. shift in mindset. Yeah, so I think, you know, we still have this, we're at this intersection right now where you've got people who are, um, you know, in leadership positions that um, may not have this full mindset yet, but they are numbers money driven and there is so much data out there i mean you can pull data from your health plan you can pull data just from you know sherm's got great resources on on you know information out there there's a lot you can pull together really and as an hr professional i think that we we have this experience of representing the company to the uh, the executives and, and the and, and vice versa right and so it's just the shift of you do need to speak their language which is the bottom line but why is that the bottom line and then this money is going to go back into the employees and explaining that and looking at the cost of replacing employees you know it's over ten thousand dollars for a professional employer or more from the day that they end to the start of a new employee and that's not even talking about training time and those are those kind of intangible numbers that you have a CFO or you know people who are looking at spreadsheets all day 
not really seen, you know, it's that penny wise pound foolish where you put those numbers in front of them and hey, we're gonna see this average, you know, turnover rate and it, this is how we can fix it. Here's what the savings could be. And then here's how we can play it in there. You're still gonna have to speak a lot of that bottom line language and really explain what those performance indicators are, but then also start peppering in, you know, it's kind of like that a little bit of a jog, you know, start peppering in the discussion of, and you know what, we just need to take care of our people and we need to help them understand that. Right. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that there needs to be, um, it's really twofold. It's coming from the employee perspective. There yeah. is something from a financial perspective, but this is really a lot about having the HR person involved in the business decisions. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. again, shifting the way in which maybe HR mm -hmm. is seen. Um, yes. Any advice on on how to get some reinforcement for that? If, if maybe <laughs> that's not what if, if that's not what the HR person has yeah. has been uh, seen as. I know that the show The Office does a really funny job of portraying HR, you know, and and then how <laughs> just being in HR for so long and then having you know how how Michael Scott interprets Toby that or you know. What's his name? I don't remember. But um, it's just, it's hilarious because it's like, yeah, <laughs> leaders don't like HR people because they view us as no people, right? Um, and so I think it's really shifting that like, yes, there's compliance and there's things we have to think about and we need to be, you know, consistent across the board, but we're also yes people. And we're also, you know, here, we, we understand the heartbeat of this organization. And these people are, are what are making this, you know, possible. And I think that that's um, that's really again. I just will keep going back to this. It's you got to meet them where they're at with that language of the bottom line and you know what's going on there. But then also coming in with the I've talked to the employees. I'm with them every single day. I know what's going on. I hear the complaints. I hear the happiness and and you know the sadness, whatever it, it may be. You know, and I think. The pandemic did a phenomenal job of exposing a lot of things and um, HR quickly had to really come to the center of everything because they were dealing with the parents who were home with their two kids and you know trying to juggle their jobs and going through burnout at an exponential rate a CFO CEO you know COO they're not dealing with that and so HR really kind of came to that forefront. And I think it's a great opportunity to continue riding that wave. But ultimately, we've got to, you know, meet them where they're at. And that's sometimes the biggest challenge. But it's it's a shift. We all want it to happen overnight. I think that it's just going to have to be, you know, again, looking at that 5, 10, 15 year plan of we're putting in the work right now. So the next generation can, you know, be reap those benefits and that's okay because that's what's making the world a better place absolutely absolutely so so probably the first step is to disrupt the status quo right i, I think mm -hmm. we get into these habits and patterns of it's just the way that it's always been yeah um as we, we only have a few more minutes but any thoughts or or perspectives on really challenging the status quo and the same old same old do you what are your thoughts about that Man, um, well, I'm not one to be afraid of conflict. So. <laughs> um, so I think that I think questioning everything is is massively important. Um, you know, I, for example, one of my kids has a metabolic disorder and she starts throwing up and she'll continue to throw up until we can get her to stop. And she typically has to go to the hospital. Um, and we were experiencing that over the weekend and went to the pharmacy to pick up Zofran and we just switched health plans because we went through an acquisition. For some reason, the pharmacy is not, my insurance plan does not cover Zofran. Any mom sitting and listening to this knows what Zofran is because it's what gets you through pregnancy. Um, and, or if you've had the throwing up kid, you know what it is. And sitting there going, why would you not cover Zofran? Now this is in the weeds, it's very small. But where do I go with that as an employee? How do I go to my HR person and not sound like I'm nagging? My expectation is that that is vetted and looked at. And, and, you know, we look at our demographics of our company and say, we've got an average of, you know, 35 year old females working here. That's our demographic or whatever it is. Right. Um, and these are the things that they're going to be needing. This is the expectation. Here's what's and 
really questioning that and then looking at those and, and saying, okay, one, how can we enhance? What can we do? If we're going to have a lot of pregnancies, what kind of partnerships can we gain? And really taking that on. For any HR person listening right now, I'm probably intimidating you. I'm probably making you feel like, I already have to do all the write-ups. I already have to do, you know, there's an average of one HR person per 300 people. It's not enough. And so really pushing that the savings will be there, getting the support and questioning those things so you can support your people and understand that they might not come to you with those questions because expectation is that you're asking those questions and that you know it and you know how to help them. Um, and so, you know, but really pushing and looking at the health plan and not just saying, okay, we're getting this off the box, you know, off the shelf and um, we're gonna just go with it. But why are we going with that health plan? How can we make it better? What vendors, what organizations, who can partner with us and, and become part of who we are and our culture to make this better and pushing those questions and making sure that that's, that's just understood. You know, it's a key part of it's, I always say this, don't mess with people's pay and benefits, but yet our benefits right. are the most overlooked cost. Right. So, yeah. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we, I can't even believe it. I just looked at the time and we are at time. I think we're supposed I to be gone. About this. We're, we have a two more minutes. So we're, we're supposed to wrap up here at 1045. So okay. let me ask you, um, you know, we, we, we like that question of like, what's one thing that you could do? Um, so as yeah. we're getting ready to, to wrap up here, what's, what's one tangible thing? Maybe think of it from two perspectives. Yeah. One, the organization that really is just starting out on this journey. And then mm -hmm. another that's maybe a little bit further along and uh, looking to push the envelope further. Yeah. Okay. So I think ultimately, you know, if you're willing to start pushing that envelope, then you're you have an appetite for change, and that's that's a good thing. Um, and so looking at you know your high cost items from you know pulling your data, taking that, um, looking at what what your high cost items are going to be, and then just starting simple with that and going okay, we're going to go out to our community. If you've got multiple locations, you're choosing you know different providers you know or facilities, and really building a partnership with them. I think sometimes it can feel contentious when you're trying to set a um, put a contract in place or whatever it is, but if you have these high ticket items that are costing you a lot every single year going and sitting down in person with these providers or these facilities and, and having that community discussion with them, um, that's just step one because it, I think it takes the anxiety out of this change and this shift because you'll, you'll learn pretty quickly that if you're willing to come to the table, they're willing to come to the table. If you've already been going through that and you're kind of in it, um, I think it's it's really about getting the employees engaged in in the process. And so you start off with this, here's what we're doing, and they kind of start seeing the benefits, and then you bring them in and you start really looking at, okay, what if you could have the best health plan, what would it be? And then start building off of that. One of my groups um, has an exceptionally high usage of mental health exceptionally high and there are you know and i look at the demographics and it makes sense um at the same time the plan is not set up to support it that well okay so how do we support those employees in that because once you get that shift of the big ticket items are saving you money you can implement that towards incentivizing and incentive programs then you can engage the employees get them in there and having them feel excited about the plan and get get their buy-in and then you can start kind of doing some more shifts it's like that sandwich approach that we all learn you know growing up and then you can kind of come in with some bigger shifts because you have that employee engagement and you've been incentivizing them for a while um and it's it's the biggest thing is making the decisions with with your employees and you know i think having them be part of it because they're that's also a big demand that's coming out anymore and so you get those big ticket items they don't know they're not they don't necessarily need to be engaged in that but what is the long-term goal of the health plan why is that important what's that going to look like that's where your employees need to be engaged um and that's they don't want decisions being made without some form of input yeah, and I imagine even just that shift in, it's not just about saving costs, right? I mean, we've all been there, done that, in which, you know, whatever conversation is being had from HR is about, well, you don't get to use your your uh, existing network or you've got to change. And it's the perception is negative or, or bad somehow. Yeah. So all of what we're talking about here through this entire event is um, not accepting those things that have been historical and just the yeah. way in which it's happened 
uh, rather saying, wait a minute, I, while I'm challenging that, it's actually ultimately to the benefit of the employee. So this is not about just yeah. a cost savings or, or yeah. making it more difficult for people. This is really ultimately, if you've mm -hmm. done it well and communicated and been very transparent, it, it's a way in which everybody wins, which I think Absolutely. in and of itself is turning the conversation around. Yeah, yeah. you could be taking the exact same steps you would have, but now you've got them involved and that's, and that's key. It's important. Um, you know, the, we heard you, we, you know, this is what you want. It makes it really hard for people to want to leave. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of, one of my best pieces of advice to an HR person is don't be the person who says no. So instead of always saying, no, we can't do, or we're not allowed yeah. to, or the policy says, well, who set the policy? We set the yeah. policy. <laughs> we <laughs> we like that. We can figure out how to undo that or mm -hmm. change it. But there's, yeah. there's something very valuable about being able to say, yes, I hear you, and here's what I can do about it, instead of, yes. but I can't do anything because yeah. it's the way that it's always been, or I mm -hmm. don't really know. And, and, and I do feel in this space, there's so much of, that uncertainty, you've given us great advice about um, you know, how, how to approach it without even necessarily being the driving force of conflict, but more for the yeah. betterment of your employees and the organization. Yeah. Awesome. Allie, yeah. thank you so very much. When Doug pops in, our time is officially up. So I wanna yeah. thank you for, for logging in and, and give yeah. a, a shout out to your kiddos for not popping yeah. in. The <laughs> Yay, it's a win today. <laughs> Big so win, big win. Yeah, big so win. I'm going to sign on off. Good luck to you for the rest of your day with them. Yeah. And I will pass it back over to Doug and uh, Lauren, who will introduce Dave. Thank you very much, Allie. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Great. Thank you all so much. I love that concept of, of using uh, better health care decisions and spending to fund uh, new HR initiatives. It's a great, great idea. And just by the way, for everyone listening, if, if this sounds like foreign speak to you if you're like but wait a minute we can't get our data we can't go out there and we've been told if we target and get, try to try to do some direct contracts with facilities they'll cancel our insurance if this sounds like crazy speak to you again stay tuned we're about to pivot and let me tell you we a, a, into solutions and to, so you can be that person you can be that person that you perhaps you can't even be that right now if you wanted to be given your plan so boy we are lucky to have this next presenter dave chase Dave is, if I had to pick who's the one person at the center of a lot of this healthcare reform, it'd be Dave Chase. And so, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dave created a company now called Health Rosetta. A lot of us who, who follow healthcare reform, uh, Health Rosetta is one of our go to. We're watching, we're listening, we're reading, we're paying attention to Health Rosetta, doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, Dave himself has written several books uh, in this space. Uh, one I love, the CEO's Guide to Restoring the American Dream. What a great read that is. I love reading that. Uh, there's another book called Engage about transforming healthcare through digital, digital patient engagement. Just a lot of good stuff out there. And you'll learn more at lunch today about what Health Rosetta is doing and what they can offer and, and how they're helping to really uh, change the cost curve here, change the care curve here. Uh, also about Dave, he is... Uh, you, you search, Google Dave Chase and you'll see all kinds of great TED Talks and information about him. Uh, Dave uh, was the co-founder of a company called Avado, which was acquired and integrated into WebMD. Who's not been to WebMD? Uh, everyone has, right? So, I mean, uh, very uh, one, one of the most widely used healthcare sites out there. Before that, he spent several years outside of healthcare and startups as a founder or, or in consulting roles with, with LiveRes.com, Market Leader, and What, what Counts all companies we've heard of. He also played founding and leadership roles in launching $2 billion businesses within Microsoft, including their Microsoft, you've heard of Microsoft's, their $2 billion healthcare platform business. So, wow. Like I said earlier, Dave looks, looks to be an adrenaline, adrenaline uh, junkie, or she calls an oxygen-fueled mountain athlete, uh, uh, along with his, uh, his father, two great kids, and also a wife there. So, Dave, it's so great to have you here. And and Lauren's joining the, uh, Dave. Lauren is Catapult's chief people officer. You think you've got it bad as an HR professional. Imagine being the HR uh, professional of a bunch of HR professionals. <laughs> so Lauren, with that, Dave, Lauren, please take it away. Good morning. Well, thank you so much for that, Doug. And Dave, That that's a phew, lots of information and, and so excited to be talking to you today. And 
also excited just to join the the, the group of these um, athletes. I know Allie mentioned that she does a lot as well. So excited to talk to you and put my facilitator hat on. I've been listening as an HR professional to all the great information that's been shared. So excited to ask you some questions. So first, I want to kind of harken back to um, what Dr. Bricker was talking about around um, the misalignment with healthcare. Um, can you, you know, talk about a little bit about, from your perspective, the examples of these um, problems with current state health care and even after the decades of focus, why these problems still exist? The, the core reason why they still exist, Dr. Bricker spoke to it, misaligned incentives and nearly four trillion reasons to protect the status quo. Um, the area he didn't go into as much, uh, which is really core, is there, there's a real problem that the normal way the industry has been set up for buying benefits is people who are representing themselves as uh, protecting the interests of the buyer, the benefits broker, are paid by the seller. You know, even though there's good people, you're going to have a guarantee of conflicts of interest there. Um, and the other, um, and so what we did was we set up a uh, plan sponsor bill of rights, right? We set up a benefits advisor code of conduct and a benefits advisor uh, compensation disclosure form. If you look at these, and if you're relatively new to um, health benefits, as I was, my background is really on the technology side of healthcare. Uh, these look like motherhood and apple pie type of principles. Unfortunately, they are 180 from the norm. And one of the areas in particular that is problematic, it's very wonky, uh, the last thing I would want to do um, is to spend a lot of time looking at contracts, but uh, unfortunately, contracting norms, you know, legal underpinnings, right, that we all have compliance, have normalized deviance, um, and that's really unfortunate. Um, you know, our relatively small team, we almost have as many attorneys on retainer billing out anywhere from $300 to $1,100 an hour as we have team members. That's how important it is and it's kind of the master key that unlocks the door to the other things that we're going to talk about because uh the thing i will do is we're shifting to solutions and i want to share three bits of good news um, that people don't typically hear number one we are already investing more than enough money to not only fund a world-class healthcare system but to fund or restore funding to what drives 80% of health outcomes. Ali was speaking to some of these things. A uh, trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars. That would be the 15th biggest economy in the world. We basically just pour down the toilet. Well, it's essentially a tax we didn't vote on to Wall Street is what it really is. Um, we didn't vote on that. We don't have to pay that tax. Smart employers don't pay that tax. Um, and that is what enables organizations that pay for sabbaticals or in the case of Rosen Hotels, which is in my TED talk, they pay for their employees' kids and their employees' college education um, and many other things. Um, so that's number one bit of good news. There's more than enough money to all fund all these things. You know, the things that actually drive health outcomes aren't the sick care system. That only drives 20% of health outcomes. It's things like having a decent paying job. It's having educational opportunities. It's ha being able to live in a decent home in a safe neighborhood. That actually is what drives health outcomes. Number two. Healthcare is not expensive. Um, that's not what you hear, right? Clinicians only get 27 cents of every dollar ostensibly we spent on healthcare. Aren't they the value creators? Um, so we want to pay for great healthcare. We don't want to pay for profiteering and price gouging. Um, and number three, which we'll talk about, is both a true and aspirational statement. Healthcare is already fixed. All the solutions to these many problems that have been talked about. Are, have already been invented, they've already been proven, and they've been modestly replicated. Um, and essentially our purpose, Health Rosetta's purpose for existing, goes back to that first point. We call it the Health Rosetta Dividend. When you stop squandering money on profiteering and price gouging and fraud and administrative bloat, there's all this money available to do the things that we actually want to do as an organization. So uh, that's where I would start. So can you talk a little bit about how you know we can improve our health 
care plans and, and what we can do to, to take control back. You mentioned a few of those big things that are impacting the cost. So how can we take control back? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, during the lunch break, but I'll, I'll uh, make a shameless plug for my book. And on the back of the book, uh, the latest one is Relocalizing um, Health, spells out local. Um, and it's a five-step plan, very straightforward. Uh, four of the five steps are invisible to the member uh, or clearly a positive. And so sometimes people um, will be worried about change. I understand that. Um, but when it's invisible or clearly positive for the five steps, uh, that's compelling. Um, and the first thing is what you're all doing here, mindset shift. Uh, second piece is kind of what I just spoke to, optimize the relationships and the plan infrastructure. It's kind of that master key. And then there were some examples in the previous uh, sessions about the profiteering in, in pharmacy. So you carve out PBM. Um, you know, PBM has generated 32 different revenue streams for themselves that most employers only think they have one or two. Um, and, that, and so all those things can be done invisible to the member, other than maybe you remove cost sharing. Um, they can have the same formulary, they can go to the same pharmacies. I mean, there's opportunities to go beyond that, but you don't have to do that. It's only the fourth one that the employer employee definitely uh, sees, which is add value-based primary care. There's no well-functioning healthcare system in the world not built on proper primary care. Uh, it's not rocket science. Um, and yep, it took us 20, 30 years to destroy primary care. It's not rocket science to rebuild it. Um, the fifth step, we're hearing about the value extracting PPOs. That's where you gotta be thoughtful about that and take a measured approach. You don't have to start there. That's where the biggest reward is because there's so much price, you know, profiteering and price gouging in that area. Um, but there's many steps you can take uh, before that. So you're talking about all these steps. If people start taking these steps, how have the three health, big healthcare institutions been reacting to this? Um, oh, well, they're, they're kind of, um, Squirreling away the nuts for the winter, um, you know they're trying to. Um, they know what's coming. Um, they're not the ones driving it, of course, because they're profiting from the the dysfunction. So they are squirreling away as much as they can. Um, you know, by far the most profitable year uh, for carriers in the last, you know, probably forever, but certainly in the last decade or two was the year of the pandemic. Like how backward is our system when by far the most profitable year uh, for carriers is when there's a pandemic. And, and then on the flip side, a lot of the independent medical groups really suffered during the pandemic. And so uh, there's some innovation theater that's happening. Um, you know, Dr. Bricker talked about so-called value-based contracts that are just kind of a, there's a little thin layer over fee for service. Um, and so, yeah, there's some innovation theater, there's some nice words, um, but uh, does, has anybody actually seen things change? Um, what we see typically as, you know, people step into it, some people rip off the Band-Aid and do it all at once, most don't, they take it a step at a time, but they'll typically see at least a 10 to 20% drop in spending, not 10 to 20% less sucky increase, like an actual drop in spending, not this fake savings that you hear about. It's kind of goofy in healthcare, like, oh, your premium's gonna go up, um, you know, $2 million and they only went up a million. That's a million dollars of savings. No, 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 that's a, that's a million dollar increase. Um, and so those are the types of things that, um, you know, you can do that, of course, um, like any, area, those profiting from the status quo are going to be the last on board. They're smart people. They'll eventually come around, um, and uh, but you can't wait for them because they're not going to be the ones driving it. When you were talking about the the, the increases or the fake discounts, it, it made me think about the shenanigans that Dr. Bricker was talking about. So, you know, to kind of take back control there, what are some of the things that you're seeing um, from around the country that employers are doing 
to take back that control. Just some specific examples for that. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that I talked about in terms of those five steps are, are right there. Um, and, you know, give you some good examples of what happened. Uh, Pacific Steel and uh, Recycling. They're about a 700 person organization. And by the way, the things I'm talking about here, we've seen in all size organizations, including ourselves, we, we did this with less than 10 employees. Um, the basic principles could be applied. We have fewer tools at our disposal. Um, when you get above 2550, it becomes a lot easier. Um, but all these things are transcend um, the size and location. We've seen it rural, urban, public sector, private sector, um, all over the country. Um, so, but let's talk about Pacific Steel. They're a good example. Um, you know, low margin, mature business. Um, and they were spending about five years ago over $8 million on their health benefits. Um, last year, they um, closed out at uh, $3.6 million. How did they do that? And benefits improved. That's the irony here. Is the best way to slash healthcare costs is to improve benefits. What I mean by improve, one of the things is they have a Ner uh, a member navigator that helps the people, you know, when you're, when you're going through a medical issue or a family member is, that's a stressful time. You're not at your best. So they help them navigate it. Um, they waive cost sharing. I think that example was given by Ali. Um, you know, if I summed up health plan design, make good decisions free, make bad decisions expensive. Most people understand zero. Um, and so what they did was uh, really in two key areas. What, the biggest savings was in the, the um, avoiding the price gouging hospitals, but the first place was in the pharmacy supply chain. Uh, as I mentioned, there's just incredible shenanigans going on there. Fortunately, there are uh, smart ways to procure medications, um, and you can typically save 30, 50% of what you've been spending on um, uh, medications by doing the things that have been talked about here. So overall, you're probably gonna get a five to 10% overall savings there. And uh, that then can fuel things like primary care. Uh, but then the other big area, they, by the way, they were in nine states, 40 locations. Um, and what they did was um, really key is, there's a concept called reference-based pricing where you dictate uh, prices or have a starting point prices off of Medicare. Despite what you'll hear from from um, kind of bloated hospitals, uh, Medicare by law you have to report your costs, um, and so unless they're committing fraud, they have to report their costs, and then their Medicare gives them some margin. Of course, they'd like to charge you 500% of Medicare rates, and many do, uh, but that's that's a choice. You can choose to pay five times Medicare rates, but you don't have to. They chose not to. Um, and basically, very little care is actually an emergency. And so when, you know, Bob needed a rotator cuff procedure, you know, member care navigator uh, picks up the phone and says, hey, Bob needs a rotator cuff procedure. We'd like to have them at your facility. And here, you know, we'll send over an agreement, very simple two-page agreement, fair to both sides, including addressing pain points the provider has. They have issues getting paid on time. Uh, they'll have to wait months to get paid by a, a carrier and get all that process. They have very little luck uh, collecting um, patient accounts receivable. That's a big problem in this era of high deductibles. And they say, hey, we'll waive all cost sharing. We'll pay you, you know, very timely, you know, a week or 10 days. Um, and they're like, where do we sign, sign up? And so in two years time, now yeah, almost three years, they have 5,500 direct contracts in place. Um, and again, these are very fair, simple contracts and they, I was just on a webinar actually last week where they took what the trend was when they started and based on, you know, actuary information and a lot of credible information this last year, if they were still in that sort of PPO madness, um, they would have spent $9.4 million, um, it's like 1100 and something per member. Um, Instead, they paid $3.6 million. 
They happened to be an employee stock owned company. So you know what that meant? There was a retire, uh, forklift driver topped out at $45,000 a year. Um, a lot of his nest egg was a share in the company. He retired with a seven figure nest egg. How many working class people are retiring with a seven figure nest egg? That's what's possible when you don't play the, you know, participate in the profiteering and price gouging. That's really powerful stuff. You know, paying your employees back on those real savings that you can incur. That's great. So you gave that great example. Um, how can we here locally in North Carolina take advantage of some of these or, or you know, get, you know, grasp this opportunity? So through something like the Hero Health or Health Rosetta. Yeah, I mean, you're going to hear more, you know, from Patrick, I believe, on Hero Health. Um, and they they've basically taken the blueprint um, that we've uh, taken. And it wasn't like, yeah, I mean, I love to to, you know, run up mountains and all that. But in this case, I didn't have to run up to the top of any mountain and cross my legs and dream this stuff up. I've just been on a scavenger hunt over the last, you know, 10, 12 years to find out what's actually working. I mean, the reason there's the name Health Rosetta is, you know, about the Rosetta Stone, it helped decipher the indecipherable Egyptian hieroglyphics. Well, for a lot of people, health, trying to decode healthcare is like trying to decode Egyptian hieroglyphics. So these are the people who cracked the code, went around the country. Um, and, and so what Hero Health has done is applied those in your backyard. Um, and it's remarkably simple. Um, you know, people want you to think like solving healthcare is like trying to solve Middle East peace. Like people like, oh, well, great to solve that, but it seems kind of hopeless and out of our control. That's what people have been led to believe. It's not true, but that's what the, the industry has, has sort of trained helplessness. And so we disabuse them of that notion, which has happened with uh, Patrick and his team. And then, you know, what is a health plan? It's not that complicated. It's actually only 15 to 20% is really an insurable event. You know, you've got your hemophiliacs, you've got your preemie babies, you've got a bunch of cancers that are really complex. Yeah, you want insurance for that, just like when you're, you know, if your house burns down. The rest of it is budgetable. You know, you're gonna have a certain number of images, you're gonna have a certain number of doctor visits, you're gonna have a certain number of hospitalizations. This is very predictable over a number of lines. Um, and so, why put a 40% insurance bureaucracy tax on stuff that doesn't need to really be insured, cut out all the fat and middlemen. And so what, what do you actually need from a care standpoint? Number one, primary care. In a well-functioning healthcare system, over 90% of the issues people come into the healthcare system for can be fully addressed in a primary care setting. Most people haven't seen that recently in the US. Fortunately, myself, I have, not only for our family, but my dad went through a five-year Parkinson's journey. Uh, with pri proper primary care, you know, doesn't turn that into unicorns and rainbows, um, but dramatically better for him and my mom and my family. Save the taxpayers probably between a quarter and a half million dollars, given what happened over those five years. So get proper primary care. Guess what? It's impossible to price gouge on an ER visit that never happened. Fifty percent of of ER visits are an emergency. It's impossible to price gouge on a surgery that never happened. 90% of spinal procedures, PT would be more effective. And so number one, get primary care. And that includes behavioral health, that includes PT, um, things like that. Then of course you've got to, you know, sometimes you need medications. We talked about that. Straightforward, work with an ethical, transparent organization, and you can get most medications people are on um, are generic. And then for the specialty drug, these so-called patient access um, programs that, that, again, with a well-designed plan, a lot of times, even up to three or four hundred percent of the federal poverty line. So you could have a four, I mean, a three, not four, six-figure um, uh, income and still be eligible for these very high-cost medications. That was one of the only good things of the Medicare Modernization Act that happened, you know, where it was this massive giveaway to the pharma where they don't have it prohibited Medicare from negotiating, but there was one good thing in that, this patient access programs. Um, and then, of course, you need specialty and hospital. So we just talked about, um, you know, what to do there. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of great independent organizations. There's great hospitals that are that have seen the future 
and we work directly with. So we're happy to work with great hospitals that operate uh, effectively. And so there's no issue there. It's just we're not interested in, in playing the, the price gouging game. And we know their costs. This is public data when they're a tax exempt uh, hospital, which most are. And so that again, they're straightforward fixes. You're not going to do it all in, in one fell swoop. Um, but that's basically what Hero Health has been putting in place. Awesome. Um, appreciate you going into um, those fixes. I want to focus on one of those fixes specifically where you talked about um, direct care and the real primary care. Can you elaborate on that and what um, you meant by that with the primary care? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what you saw, saw in fact, you have that direct experience in North Carolina uh, with a medical group. There's a lawsuit going between this doctor group and the big health system there. And in that lawsuit, um, the, the big health system says that each of those primary care docs is worth $14 million. So boom, right there. Like, why do they have primary care as milk in the back of the store? It's this loss leader, right? If they're basically forced as employees to push people down the hall to the $4,000 MRI when, you know, across the street, same equipment, it's three or $400, those type of things, um, you want to have independent, unconflicted primary care docs working on your behalf. And when you do that, again, the organizations that have done this longest, I mentioned Rosen Hotels, um, that's been doing it for 25 years, and they are in the worst healthcare market in the country in terms of price gouging hospitals. 40% of the most expensive hospitals are in Florida, and yet they're spending 55% less per capita on health benefits with the best benefits package I've heard of any company in the country. And I was at Microsoft during their heyday when we didn't pay a dime. And at the foundation is that primary care. What does it include? Yeah, primary care doc. It includes health coach, PT, chiro, pharmacy, um, dietitian, right? They just kind of went step by step and they didn't know anything about healthcare 25 years ago, but they know, knew that it was the only area in their supply chain where either things like in the, the rest of your supply chain, the value proposition generally stays the same every year or gets better every year. In healthcare, great news, pay more, get less. And they said, no, nah, we're not going to participate in that. And so that's the type of thing that, you know, and it, it happens abroad too. Like in, in Denmark, 92% of the issues people go in to, uh, you know, the healthcare system for, they go and get it fully taken care of in primary care. By the way, 70% of their, their hospital beds aren't uh, there anymore. They're not necessary. Now, we're more geographically distributed. I'm not saying 70%, but we put these poor hospital CEOs in this weird position of turning them into hotel general managers where they're supposed to fill beds. Like, in what world is it good that people are in a hospital? Um, you know, Dr. Bricker talked about the the woman that had the thyroid uh, surgery, but they gave her this stress test that they didn't know, and then she had a stroke. Um, I'll, I'll give you another example, a woman who had a chest pain in her left side because of a new workout program, but she's like, oh, left side, maybe that's a, a heart attack or something. And she couldn't get any access to her primary care doc, so she went to the ER and went into that same kind of thing where they're like, oh, we have, you know, it's it's probably just your new workout program. You were doing bench press and you stretched that muscle. But, you know, we have this new equipment, like let's do MRI. You know, you can find these what they call incidental omas that are the things that are are non-factors. But of course, you can always find something. You know, basically get an MRI, punch your ticket for surgery or cardiac catheterization. Well, they went and did the catheterization. They punctured her aorta. Um, they had to give her a graft. The graft uh, rejected. Four weeks later, she had to have her heart replaced because she tore a muscle um, in a workout. And the third leading cause of death in America is preventable medical mistakes. Every day, there are 10,000 serious issues because of a preventable medical mistake. So our health, you know, it is not innocuous to get overtreated. Um, and so I would really emphasize that. Again, you solve primary care, you don't have an opioid issue. 
you, you solve primary care, you don't have this rising benzos issues, which is going to probably be as bad or worse than opioids. That's how important it is. I would say when I'm at events, I want to take nuggets back to you know my organization and focus on those, and that definitely is going to be one of those nuggets that I'm taking back you know to the organization. I hope others do too. Um, so we're winding down on our time. Um, we're getting close to, but I do have a few more questions for you. Um, first, what's the next big thing? Do you think? around healthcare disruption and restoration? Yeah, um, God, well, I mean, you have, you have one of them with Hero Health. I mean, this is the first statewide organization I've heard that has put together this plan proactively and then it can then get tailored um, to the employer. So, I mean, that is, that is very significant. And there's been some really great things happening in North Carolina, in part because there's, um, been some pretty dramatic um, price gouging that's been going on. And so there's pushback, understandably so. Uh, you know, I already mentioned the innovation in primary care. It's actually one of the most active areas for venture funding right now. And IPOs, there's some really great work as we're rebuilding primary care brick by brick. Um, hospital at home, right? There's very few things that actually have to be done in the hospital. ICU, great, have a hospital almost everything else. I mean, you're seeing um, all kinds of examples. You're, you know, including imaging, you know, getting to kind of delivered to your front door. Um, so there's some really cool innovation there. And hospitals, frankly, are the most dangerous place in America. I mean, that is where you pick up uh, infections. That's where you have the preventable medical mistakes. Um, you know, it's, it's very dramatic. I mean, we basically have a 9-11 every day in hospitals in terms of preventable medical mistake death. And so you want to stay out of the hospital if you don't need to go there. There's a time and a place for hospital, that's great. Um, and then the other area is there's really, um, as I mentioned earlier, contracting norms have normalized deviance. And so it's this wonky, boring legal stuff. Um, sorry to Bruce, who is, you know, reformed lawyer, but like, you know, I'd rather eat broccoli or, you know, have pick splinters out of my feet than look at legal agreements. But like, it's really the master key that unlocks a door. I mean, it's incredible the how tilted the playing field is in these contracts. Um, just give you one anecdote. Um, one of the big PBMs that was mentioned earlier, um, I have a uh, colleague who was the head of government affairs for them. He was in the general counsel's office in his old job and they had this, I think it was a four to five inch thick legal agreement that was with General Electric, GE, who you think is savvy on procurement and legal. And they were yucking it up that they didn't have a prayer because of all the sort of little time bombs and trap doors and all that. So GE is getting schooled I can assure you that the norms in these contracts, you just need to light a fire to those contracts. There's nothing almost to save about them. You have to do a reset. That's always the case, right? When there's a, a, a change, you have to do a reset, build from the ground up. Every CEO in America says, employees are our most valuable asset. You need to steward that asset well. And the smart CEOs are saying to the supply side of the industry. This is our most valuable asset. It is a privilege for you to serve our most valuable asset. We want to procure our medications, our care in this way. We would love for you to participate with us in that, and we will have an agreement. Even one of the big three PBMs, if you do that, you can get a good price. A lot of people write off the big three PBMs. You can actually get a good price out of one of the three, but of course they won't give it to you unless you ask. And so those, that's the kind of innovation. It's kind of wonky, but it is really key. Great, so next question for you. And I'm taking this from my colleague, Molly, who asked Allie this. Um, first, you know, what's one thing, you know, we can do as organizations or HR professionals or executives, you know, to kind of get the ball rolling, you know, start implementing these changes. And then alternatively, for those that are really into disruption and are ready to, you know, get at it, what's, what's something that they can do? Yeah, I mean, again, the, the number one thing is education. Um, and, and this is a just untapped, uh, I mentioned Pacific Steel. 
I talked to the CFO and said, uh, or asked him, uh, would would you what kind of increase would you have had to have in top line sales to have the same profit impact? You know, this is a low margin, mature organization. He said we would have had to have top line sales increase of twenty to thirty percent, probably twenty five to thirty percent. This is about a two hundred million dollar a year company. It'd be my rough in the private, but rough estimate. Um, that's tough. You're talking what forty, fifty, or more million dollar increase in a slow growth. You know, so that's a bottom line increase. Um, and the other thing I found when I talk to CEOs, I, I'm not afraid to be direct and provocative. One of the books I wrote is called The Opioid Crisis Wake Up Call. It looks at the opioid crisis through the lens of, um, it looks at the healthcare system through the lens of the opioid crisis. Guess what? There's 12 major drivers of the opioid crisis. Um, it's over, often oversimplified, by the way. 11 of the major 12 drivers, the key unwitting, and I'd emphasize unwitting enabler, are employers. It's what their our dollars, our plans, funded and fuel and have fueled the opioid crisis. Think about who's impacted, working age people and their dependents, our bills. In fact, an advisor, in our program, one of the original advisors, um, I think he was a little confused why I was so rabid about the primary care issue, and um, and I then wrote this book. And he's he went back and looked at his book of business. It wasn't this massive book of clients, and he'd found in the prior year 22 um, people in his plans he'd put in had died of opioid overdoses in the prior year. 20 of the 22 were dependent. That was a severe gut punch to him. And then he became a man on a mission. He doesn't put in a plan without proper primary care. Every CEO I've talked to has had a personal experience with opioid and benzos. Benzos is worse. Like when you withdraw from opioid, you feel like you're going to die. When you withdraw from benzos, this is like um, Xanax, Valium, and it's exploded during COVID. You may die when you withdraw from Xanax. It is extremely hazardous. People are getting prescribed with no plan to get off of them. Uh, I could go on the stories. And when you talk to a CEO and say, you have enabled this by your not looking at this, it's hard, right? That is not an easy conversation to have, but they've all been touched by it. And that is their dollars. That is their plans. That are their employees. That's their employees' kids. I'm really passionate about that. Uh, I've seen the devastation. And so this is not just a dollars and cents thing. This is lives on the line. And what, sometimes I get in, you know, introduced as a disruptor. I take issue with that. I'm not a disruptor. I'm a restorer. We're restoring the American dream. We're restoring sanity here. This system is off the rails and we've heard about that. So I apologize if I'm getting a little emotional, but it is a life and death issue here. That's how important it is. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, you know, hearing again through education and through direct primary care, all these good things. Is there any last, you know, words that you want to share with anyone um, listening to help, you know, to help them impact their organization's health plans, their, you know, their in, you know, reducing their costs and help be restorers like you are? Yeah, I mean, the, earlier on there, there was, um, I think Bruce talked about, you know, we'll kind of outrage you. And he was outraged. And, and um, you know, uh, there was, you know, Doug talked about that as well. Um, it's just how upsetting, you know, those, those stories earlier. Um, what I like to do is, is take people on this arc, inform, enrage, empower, activate. And you're going to, this is kind of this crash course today in that you're getting informed. I, you should be outraged. You should be enraged. We're empowering you with this information and it's on you to activate it. The solution is not coming from DC. We've had both parties in full control. It's on us, right? This, in my view, there is no greater immediate threat to our country than our status quo healthcare system. I wrote a chapter in the CEO's Guide to Restoring the American Dream. I broke this down. We have gone to war for less than what our status quo healthcare system has done. And so it is on us. And 
I think health professionals are the, I mean, health benefits professionals on both sides of the equation, the most underestimated role in the entire healthcare system. I would, uh, I actually wrote a piece in Forbes, this job could save America. Um, that's how important, it's probably the most underestimated role in the entire economy because of that. This is in your power um, and that's what this is all about. And so that would really be what I would leave with. It's, it's not, the Calvary's not coming from DC to fix this. Um, it's on us to fix it. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dave. This was so informational. I, I was, you know, taking notes as well and, and excited to, to start implementing some of these things in my organization as we're, you know, creating our, our new benefits plan. So appreciate you, appreciate your time. Um, and I'm excited now to move, you know, you've been our pivot point into solutions. We've gone through the outrage and are, are looking forward to that. So I'll, I'll give it to Doug now to take it from there. Great. Well, thank Thanks. you, Lauren. Great. Thanks, Dave. As as I knew you would, you really hit that hit a home run there, several home runs in a row. So, all right, everyone, from an admin standpoint, yes, we are going to give you a lunch break until 12. Dave's going to stay around for a while and, and give you a nice overview of what helpers that is. So feel free to munch on your sandwich or whatnot and, and listen to Dave for a while. And then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back officially uh, at 12 o'clock. And we're going to really bring this down to North Carolina local solutions practical solutions that are already in place. You've heard a lot of great snippets and a lot of great information. You've heard these things mentioned, but what is that thing? What are you talking about? That's our afternoon session is, is solutions that are already in place here. So again, I'll see you back officially at, at, uh, at noon, but for now, Dave, please take it away. I'd love to hear more about your organization. Okay, great. Thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, so we, um, you know, we actually, the tip of the spear for us was launching an advisor program. Um, Patrick Long um, kind of went through that, that process. But then as we got in, we found we needed to kind of help inform and educate the employer side. Um, and, and so that's what we're gonna talk about here. And uh, probably the, the chapter that has resonated the most with CEOs uh, from the CEO's guide to restoring the American dream is there's a chapter entitled, uh, you're in the healthcare business, whether you like it or not, you know, here's how you can make it thrive. And so that's kind of the, the point, um, you know, that you will have often healthcare be the second or third biggest cost. So you are in that business. And so a lot of times HR is under-resourced and needs to put the same, you know, the CEO and, and CFO need to put the same appropriate focus there. And so we say, let's talk about the healthcare business. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. And so this is a real, you know, simplified um, view of your supply chain. Um, again, there's, there's lots of reasons if you want to protect the status quo to overcomplicate this, but it's pretty straightforward. You know, you have Employees or members, they see the doctor, a bill is set, a bill is paid, right? That's really what it's about. Um, and so what if we go to the next slide, you'll see that there's kind of leakage, you know, in that supply chain. Do you actually have a good doctor? Um, is the course of action the best one? You know, the I mentioned the opioid issue, lower back pain, second most common reason people go to the the doctor after cold and flu. We absolutely botch it. The second, uh, it's the number one driver of disability. It's the number one driver of opioid prescriptions. Um, even though there's no evidence that uh, opioids are the most effective treatment for lower back pain, um, it's really sad. So we've, we've while, because it's basically a chemical intervention for a mechanical issue. Um, and so the, at best, it masks short-term pain while the underlying problem uh, persists or gets worse, and therefore you have addiction or continued pain. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Starbucks did a study with Virginia Mason, which is a high-value center in the Seattle Medical Center. They found that 90% of the spinal procedures are useful. So appropriate care is important. Then you send a bill. Are they reasonable? You know, we have a case study in my last book, Copper State. They found a million dollars in savings without changing their network. They're their carrier, the PBM, they just started watching what was going on. It goes into what, what was done there. A lot of times it's crazy what gets in these bills. And I can tell you the start of my career was working in 
as a consultant in the billing departments at hospitals, I don't think there's ever been a bill over $10,000 that has, hasn't had an error. So you watch that carefully. The carriers are not incented to do that. Um, and then um, the, the bill is paid. Well, you know, $300 billion, this was an estimate from eight years ago. I'm sure it's higher from the FBI and uh, Accenture that that's how much fraud there is in the system. It can be up to 10% of the dollars. I mean, we've seen claims where somebody had six circumcisions in six days from six doctors. <laughs> I don't think that's medically possible. Um, and all of these other once in a lifetime medical procedures, it was, uh, it's in, if you talk to any cyber crime expert, um, healthcare is the easiest pickings. It's by far the easiest. And there's a whole chapter on that in my book. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, clinicians only get 27 cents of all, every dollar. Let's pay for great care. Let's not pay for all this other stuff. Go ahead and uh, advance. And so it's really just bringing that approach to your healthcare spend. Go ahead and advance. And so this is our blueprint. You'll see the blue items are kind of the underpinning, kind of the boring stuff, but it is kind of that master key that unlocks the savings in the purple areas. And you see the cumulative savings, um, and each of these is kind of additive. Um, you can get some direct savings in value-based primary care, uh, but it's really important, particularly on medically complex things that you have, like my dad through the Parkinson's journey, had somebody there to kind of navigate that. The transparent open networks is basically the successor to the PPOs, these, these streamlined agreements, having great approaches for uh, complex and outlier patients. That was an example given earlier in the, the outrage stories about um, end-stage renal disease, lots of profiteering and price gouging going on there. So you just have, you have to have countermeasures, just like any Corporate IT security manager has countermeasures against the hackers. And in this world, the hackers are the healthcare system. And then proper um, uh, benefits. So we have on our site, in our books, um, in the employer program, all these things, we have lots of information. We open source most of it. So you can learn about these things. And so you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. And it, you kind of get into this recurring loop. So it starts with that mindset shift I talked about. Then you architect a plan, you implement it, and then you optimize. This is not set it and forget it. Like how goofy is it that we just think about health benefits once a year at open enrollment? Like we don't think about sales. We don't think about supply chain once a year. And we have employees, I'm pretty sure, all year long. Um, and so it's just this iterative loop where maybe you do one or two of the steps that I mentioned in that kind of five-step local process. And new challenges arise. I would predict that you'll see a lot of issues in stem cell um, related and genomic stuff. There's gonna be about 2% that will be incredible, game-changing, life-changing, that we would love and embrace. And then you'll probably have at least 95%, 98% that will essentially just be another excuse to price gouge. You know, healthcare is the only uh, industry that I know of that uses technology is an excuse for prices to go up and productivity to go down. So you got to have countermeasures on these things, have somebody watching this. And so that's why this iterative loop happens. Um, and then there's this five-step process that I mentioned earlier. This is on the back of the book. Um, again, four of the five steps are either invisible to the member or clearly positive. And that's generally where I would say to start. Um, and so again, the book goes into detail. You can download all our books for free off our site, just go to healthrosetta.org and you say, get the book, you can get any of them. In fact, there's uh, an executive summary that's like a six page version of the CEO's guide. We're about to, to publish the same thing for the latest book, The Relocalizing Health. Um, there'll also be an executive summary. So you could share that, say with your COO, your CFO, your COO, CEO, if you're not that person yourself. Um, go ahead and advance. And so, you know, just the tip of the spear, I always get asked, where's the first place I should start? Um, get your benefits broker on board. Uh, if they're not on board, if they, they push back or are balk at the advisor, 
compensation disclosure form. We make that available on our site. It's in the book. This is straightforward. If you're doing great work, you're not um, going to hide that. And so get that. And then we have all these resources, right? We've got books, we've got webinars, um, we've got these transparency tools like the advisor uh, compensation disclosure form. And then the different, when you say component overviews, each of those things, the primary care, the value, the transparent pharmacy benefits, we outline these things so that you can understand. Nobody's born with this knowledge, so we wanna give you the tools um, to get this. And you, again, you can get these in the books and you can get them off of the website. Go ahead and advance. And so for folks who want to go a little faster, um, we have an employer program. Um, and like the advisor program, we've, we've started building a community there. And uh, I think in the next slide, we go into a little bit on what's in that program. And so we have these round tables. We've got office hours. We've got all kinds of case studies. Um, you know, we've kind of got a hotline you can call. Um, there's something that we call a plan opportunity summary that's kind of a high level, think of it as like a second opinion on your health plan. We're used to second opinions for you know cancer or something like that. Why not have a second opinion on your plan? Uh, I know that Patrick um, Long can, can do that. Um, and, uh, but we have that in the uh, employer program as well. And uh, these are, and you can go to our site, if you just go to our site, click on the employer information, there's a little bit more detail. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And I think we outline, you know, it's basically decision makers, right? Who is it for? Typically for the employers, 50 to 500. We've got a few that are less than 50, but that's really where the, kind of the sweet spot is. It's, it's a $99 a month program, no long-term commitment. You want to do it for three months and be on and off, that's fine. Um, and we are uh, kind of staging our growth on this. So if you want to, if you do have interest, you can just go ahead and look at the link below, the healthrosetta.org slash employers, and gives a little more information. You can sign up and just, you'll get plugged in. And we have people from very experienced folks that still see opportunities um, that are in the program to people who haven't even made the first step. And it's nice to have that community of like-minded people, just like we have with the benefits advisors. So. Um, that's, I think, the final slide. There might be another slide, um, but that's really, um, oh, no, I forget. There, there are some things that we do one-on-one -on -one, um, that's a little bigger investment. We call it Health Rosetta Inside, and uh, there's four key areas. There's enabling technology, right, to make it easier, and there's a lot of different people that are involved in a plan, so there's one single secure source of truth. We have enabling services. Um, we have this opportunity analysis that's sort of where the plan opportunity summary is this kind of high level, you know, 30,000 foot. This is get into the weeds, very deep detail. You know, it's probably a two or three month process. We're getting into the data, um, all these kinds of things, um, including looking at legal agreements where there are so many problems and we highlight how those should change. We have different um, kind of advocacy and community building things where, you know, we're building out the provider access for post PPO um, provider access. You know, we know that um, the PPOs unfortunately have just kind of become a glorified yellow pages slash value extraction device. We need to have a good alternative, so we do work there. And then a lot of this is standardizing um, this new marketplace of, you know, from project plans, like this doesn't have to be 100% art. It should maybe be. 70% science, 30% art. And so we do a number of things to make this much more plug and play the way the vendors plug in. Right now, it's while there's tremendous value in these, these high performing plans, it is more work. That's more work for your benefits consultant typically on uh, the, the claims process or all that. Um, absolutely worth it. You know, we're trying to lower that barrier. Um, and so that's what some of the things we're doing there and we can go into more detail and, and I think the next slide kind of breaks down uh, some of what we do. We kind of have three tiers of health rosette inside depending on how deep you want to get into it. Um, and so these are actually the types of things that we're collaborating with Hero Health on. So this is essentially baked in to 
um, when we're working together in the hero health scenario. Um, so I won't go through these all in detail, but suffice it to say, it's a very comprehensive look. If you want to spend, you know, get twice the healthcare at half the cost, it's actually being done. This is how we do it. Um, again, part of this process is understanding the organization culture, their appetite for change. That's part of the interview process we go through. And do are you willing to have changes on, for the member or not? If you are or aren't, you're going to have different strategies, these types of things. And then we also have regular <clears throat> uh, webinars, and twice a year we have summits um, that uh, we invite you to. Um, so I think that might be the last slide. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're reachable. You can reach me at dave at healthrosetta.org. The URLs I gave you, Patrick um, and the Catapult team know how to get a hold of me and the rest of the team. And so, um, Appreciate sticking around during the lunch and uh, please reach out to us. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm happy to, if there is, happy to take any questions. Yes, absolutely. We've got, we've still got 20 minutes. So if there's questions, please ask them. Okay. Right. You know, one thing I, I, I like about just listening to this, Dave, is that, it, you know, again, for the person that's been used to being fully insured or level funded or in this carrier world, this is Greek, you know, what, what do you, all these things you're talking about are like, what? Well, I couldn't do that. Or even things like spending money on that. Well, that's extra money. But it's just, it's interesting how that, you know, Patrick talks about kind of crossing the river, you know, to all this good innovation, which large companies have known about for years. It's just not, ne never really been a solution for small companies. And so I think that's a big part of this is there's so much information and systems and processes you've developed behind the scenes that employers don't have to go alone. This is not them. It's not go read a book and try your best. There's a lot of believe, even though you've been you've been schooled to think otherwise as an employer, uh, that no, it is what it is. You can't do anything but just hold your nose and just bear it uh, and shop your plan every three years. Uh, there's stuff. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, absolutely. I um, mean, it's definitely in your control, and it's just a matter of what you want to do when and how how long do you want to um, enable you know, this system that's run amok. You know, one of the things I do at Catapult is drive innovation. And every time I've got a new harebrained idea, my boss always, Bruce always says, I bet you someone's done that somewhere. Go find people that have done that. And that's, it, CEOs think that way. Let's don't go reinvent the wheel here. If, we, if we've got out of control healthcare spend, I bet you somebody somewhere has fixed this. And, and your great message today is, oh, it's been fixed over and over and over and over and over again. It's just a matter of bringing it local, bringing it local to, to, to our employers here in North Carolina. Yeah, there's a, there's a famous quote that says the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. And that's the thing. On the scavenger hunt that I went on, I found all these solutions and just abstracted them and then shared them. And, you know, I sort of tongue in, tongue in cheek, you know, in my LinkedIn profile, I say I'm the Johnny Appleseed of what works in healthcare to, to spend half of what you're spending. Um, you know, there's still, if you spend half of what you're spending, there's still 23 cents to pay for everything else besides clinicians. I mean, obviously you need the hospitals and you need some risk management and things like that. Um, but uh, you don't need to be spending what you're spending. And I can assure you if, if I had, I mean, I was working in hospitals a long time ago. Um, if, if I told them probably even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, they would be making half of what they're making now, they would be over the moon. They've just, you know, we, we've really enabled that. You know, it's just like, a, you know, Paris Hilton. She probably wasn't taught budget discipline. Um, can you blame her, right? Um, and so we haven't uh, really required our healthcare system to, um, to operate like they ought to. Other businesses, other hospitals around the world, it's just been this weird... Um, anomaly in our economy. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any questions coming in. So um, great. So what a great presentation. We really thank you so much for being part part of this, Dave, uh, and look forward to working more together in the future. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, okay, we're going to pivot now into solutions, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Patrick Long. You've seen Patrick a few times in the past on some of our some of our activities. Patrick is the founder of, of Hero Health. You've heard Hero mentioned a few times. And so 
again, the afternoon session is me meant to be an education process for you of, of some things that are working locally. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, we're all about being practical. Uh, and so we want to help you understand what your options are. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn over to Patrick and let him kick off the afternoon session. Patrick, it's all yours. Thanks, Doug. Um, really appreciate uh, all that the Catapult team is doing to uh, help the members here on the call um, and uh, everything that you're doing around the state to become the resource for mid-sized, small, and mid-sized businesses uh, here in the great state of North Carolina. So thank you for your leadership there uh, and the whole team. Uh, it's been a great show so far. We've brought uh, national speakers, you know, this is a big problem where, as, as Bruce let off, uh, there's no silver bullet. We're not going to solve it uh, quickly. It's a journey, right? And I like to start with this word, control. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's good to really understand that, take a step back and say, what is controlled? Uh, healthcare is your second or third largest spend. Um, having control over that is having what it says here, power or influence that determines the outcome, uh, command over something or someone. Do you have control over your plan or does it have control over you? Uh, is, and, and for most of us on the call today, uh, that's what we're talking about really is, is taking back control. Um, healthcare influences everything from absenteeism to uh, EBITDA, retention, attraction, reputation, all of the above. Um, and so that's our purpose here today. So the morning session, as Doug said, was about the more of the problems, the systematic problems and a little bit of the solutions and hints. We're going to get local here in the second half. Um, so let's take a look under the hood. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, what's inside a status quo plan? You, you heard us say this term over and over again in the morning session. Um, what's a status quo health plan? It's a carrier in control plan. The carrier has control over you, your employees, um, and there's four components of, a, of a, each plan. So in a carrier control plan, you have these four components, but in the insurance part, uh, the carrier makes more profit when your claims go up. I'll say that again slowly because it's super important. As your claims rise, your carrier's profits increase. Okay, that's very important to know if you're in a carrier control plan. Um, that's not very strategic, I think you'd agree. Uh, we had a renewal, or we had a new client come on this week, actually. Uh, we finished re uh, enrollment on Friday. And when we brought this to the broker, the broker brought it to the Babuka carrier, they had a 12% renewal. It's about a 100 life group, 12% uh, renewal. Um, the broker told them they were shopping for other ideas, other plans, and the uh, carrier insurance company came back and said only 6% increase. And then they uh, were considering that along with Hero and, and Proactive Solutions. Just like that, they dropped the rate in half. Um, and then when they realized that the, the broker told them they're serious they're, this time, they really are thinking about switching, uh, they dropped the rate to zero, flat from 12 to six to zero. And then when he told them about us, that they were going self-funded and being really proactive, they dropped it again and offered a, I think it was a two month premium holiday, no insurance cost for two months. So 12 to six to zero and then free insurance. Do you know what the CEO of that company said? He said, that just proves what Patrick's been saying, that they had control, they're making so much profit on us. It just reinforces that we're going to change. Uh, that's really strategic thinking. So that's your insurance, right? That's your risk. The next one is admin. Your your ASO, if you're in a carrier control plan, you would need to move to a TPA. Um, and and that's super important because you want the company that's steering your members to better quality, better outcomes uh, than higher profits. The next one at the top on the right is network. Um, okay, so somebody said uh, to me yesterday that a PPO stands for persistently passive overpayment. Um, according to the RAND study, so a super respected national group, the RAND study, they studied uh, hospitals and payments and uh, PPOs all over the country. In North Carolina, 
employers like you pay 270% of Medicare. So same procedure, same day, same hospital. Medicare pays $1,000, your plan pays 2,700. That's after your discount from the PPA. So um, it's, it's a far more than cash price. So you're paying to get a logo on your card, to go to a hospital or a provider of any kind, and then overpay. That's what you're doing. That's your network. And then pharma, we're gonna to talk to a uh, leading uh, PBM and pharmacist in just a, about a half an hour, 45 minutes about pharma. But is it a coincidence that the largest carriers all own a pharmacy benefits management company? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the Blues own Prime, United owns Optum, Cigna owns Express Scripts, um, Aetna owns CVS Caremark. All of the big carriers have bought uh, PBMs. Is that to lower your costs? Have you seen your costs go down for drugs or is that to increase their profits? I'll let you decide. Um, we switch to the next slide. And so, if the, what we're talking about here in this whole big show today is what if, what if we unbundle and improve our plans? And that's taking the same four components, insurance, network, admin, pharma, and doing better, right? Just like unbundling uh, can get you better, uh, everything from legal services to cable TV or whatever, everything's being unbundled. Well, we're unbundling insurance carefully uh, and, and, and appropriately. So your insurance is taken not to one company to bid, but to the market. And you buy the right insurance for the right time. Your admin steers, sits on your side of the table and steers to quality, higher outcomes, better value, not more profit. They're paid a flat, transparent fee. They do not profit from when they send your employees to better places. Um, your network, we could still use a network if you'd like to use a network. Everybody likes to start small, kind of walk before you run, um, start with a network, but don't pay three times uh, the PEPM fee that we're seeing from the big carriers. Uh, there's better networks available. There's nothing preferred about your preferred provider organization, your PPO, there's nothing preferred about it anymore. Um, and importantly, pharma, this is the fastest rising category in your plan. Super important to take back the PBM. And this is something you can often do without doing anything else. This should be the first thing you do is switching to an independent uh, PBM, uh, a transparent one that signs an agreement like Dave Chase talked about, transparent contracts being the key, the master key to unlocking savings. First place to start is with PBM. So. All of these things are so important and, and we're going really quickly and covering a lot of ground. Um, so we can follow up with you at a later date, but the first step you take to cross that river from the uh, carrier control to company back in control is self-funding. And so uh, that's gonna be the next session. And uh, then I'll follow up with some real world examples with a leading DPC doctor, a leading pharmacist and a surgery center expert uh, to, to wrap things up. So uh, Doug, if you wanna take it away. Yes, I, I will. Uh, th thanks so much, Patrick. Uh, we, did, we did a quick poll and thank you for your poll. And the poll was interesting. Uh, there you see the results there in terms of what percentage are covered by a self-funded plan. Uh, you can see the, the, the results there that, that uh, looks like, um, most people thought it was 27% uh, or 17%. So what's the yeah, answer there? The, the real answer is 67% of American workers are covered by self-funded plans. How is that? And so uh, it, it, it's, it's not a trick question. It's just, uh, we are so used to hearing, uh, and it's, it's disproportionate, right? I was doing a video earlier. Um, the, the groups under 200 are about 31% switch. But total workers in America, two thirds are covered by self-funded plans. You know, so what we're saying to the middle market out there is, um, and, and, and the folks at this meeting are paying attention and taking notes and emailing and texting and stuff. So it's, it's you're not going it alone. You're not bleeding edge here, right? They're, they're, you know, like Dave Chase said, we're just taking the things that have worked in other parts of the country and we brought them here to North Carolina. So. Great. Thanks, Patrick. So great there that, the reason it's two thirds is because uh, 
the larger companies have been doing this for a long time. So today's about, there's a question asked about, is this stuff for small companies? Yes, this is exactly for small companies. What you're going to learn in the next section is there are ways to sell fund that aren't as scary and ominous as perhaps you thought of in the past. Maybe in the past you thought self-funding meant you open your checkbook up and just pay every claim with your checkbook. And there's a lot of ways to do this. So that's that's our next session. I want to introduce a couple people here now on the on the on the on the on the call now. Uh, David Dow is with Hub International. Uh, David is, is a senior employee benefits advisor with Hub, uh, with a focus on 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 plan funding. Uh, strategies. Uh, so again, that's a great person to have here. And also Cody Parker is with a company called East Coast Underwriters. And as it may sound, they actually underwrite and provide medical stop loss insurance. So again, you've got great people here. Millie Aponte is with Catapult. Millie leads our benefit administrative services function here, our, our TPA, our, our uh, FSA, HSA, HRA, all the other A's <laughs> service <laughs> here. And so you guys, I'll take, let you guys take it away and talk about how self-funding perhaps isn't as scary as we, all, we once thought it was. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, it's about crossing the river. So let's take a look at this cartoon slide because we think it really tells a powerful story. The company executives just got their renewal rates, but the forecast is cloudy. They want to explore, cross the river, get to the better place where we know that business leaders and plan sponsors do best if they have confidence and control of their strategy. But first, in order for them to take back control over this significant investment, and we've heard it over and over again, they must leave that carrier control. And that's exactly what happens when they go self-funding. Companies can get it all. It starts with getting access to their data, and then they can make start, smarter decisions about pharmacy, surgery, and primary care, which we are going to hear all about soon. So all with local providers, the end result is always better outcomes plus higher incomes. So I'm really happy to be here with you today and with me, David, and Cody. Um, so welcome. If I would um, ask each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your role and what your services are. David, we'll start with you. All right, great. Thanks, Millie. So listen, I really appreciate you hosting the session. Appreciate uh, Catapult team for pulling this together. So <clears throat> I've been an employee benefits consultant in uh, North Carolina since 1999. Um, yeah, reached, uh, I, I guess, a point a few years ago where I just said, gosh, if I'm gonna keep doing this for another you know, 15, 20 years, I've got to find a new way. I was tired of delivering you know, the same renewals, uh, indefensible, no data, no transparency. How many times can you do that and, and you know, keep your sanity, keep your professional motivation? And self-funded, uh, different arrangements from uh, completely unbundled to you know, partial arrangements to uh, captive arrangements, uh, you know, came about and, and really re-energized and refocused my professional direction. So I've really been focused on the self-insured model, which um, as everyone's heard today and as many folks on the call, um, I guess, feel is that was an unattainable model for that small to mid-sized employer. So that's where our focus has been. Excellent. Cody? Awesome. Um, yes, so um, as mentioned previously, my name is Cody Parker. Um, I'm with East Coast Underwriters. So we are actually a, um, what is called a managing general underwriter, but we, we underwrite the medical stop loss side of, of unbundling and moving away from, from those fully insured plans. Um, so, so we're actually providing that, that catastrophic insurance coverage for you um, to help you sleep at night when you do decide to go through with the, the self-funding of your health benefits. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good, good uh, brief overview there and, and looking forward to the, to the panel. Thank you both. Uh, if you can please advance. Tucker, next slide, please. Thank you. So what is self-funding? So for those of you that are currently either fully insured or level, level funded, <laughs> Simply put, self-funding is an alternative funding platform where the company assumes the financial risk associated with health care claims. Employers will typically partner with a third-party administrator for claim payment and customer service. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is it is riskier. So there are strategies uh, that you can incorporate, like purchasing purchasing stop loss insurance to protect against excess loss for both individual claimants and the plan as a whole. So once you've won back that control, you can start reducing costs by adding additional cost containment strategies. So let's start with this one. Um, David, can you um, walk us through these reasons as to why employers should highly consider going self-funded? Sure, absolutely. So <clears throat> I would suspect the, the vast majority of folks on the call today are fully insured. So you know, why don't we talk about fully insured for a minute? You know, when you're fully insured, do you have transparency into your claims? You know, unless you're a large fully insured plan or you have a very astute broker and you're, you know, 100 plus employees, you traditionally get no data. So you don't have transparency into what's going on in your plan. You know, how about your flexibility in your current plan? Can you partner the deductibles you want with the co-pays you want, with the right motivators that you want for your folks, with the, the right telemedicine benefit, the right pharmacy program? No, you pick from a, you, you pick from a grid, right? You pick from a, a prepackaged program. So you don't have that flexibility. What about control? You know, do you get to control PBMs in a huge part of the conversation today? Do you get to pick your PBM? Do you get to pick the specialty drug programs? Uh, someone mentioned earlier today, uh, the specialty uh, alternative funder programs, huge success. I mean, six figure opportunities for our clients there. Do you have that control? Has anyone ever come to you and said, which PBM and what strategy would you like to, to pair with your full insure program? No. So when we talk about self-funding, it's just a different, you're, you still have insurance, Millie. You're, you still have protection when the big claim hits. You still have protection when a lot of claims hit. So you've still got insurance that sits behind the scene, but you're buying the bare minimum insurance. You know, I think we'll hit this later, but maybe it's 30, 40% of your cost instead of what you perceive now as your insurance is 100% of your cost. Um, you know, you, you get to pick the PBM, you get to pick the, the control, uh, you get insight, transparency into the data so that you can then make armed decisions that, that really don't require us to be that bright, right? I mean, we get, in data, we get data, we get, um, you know, comparative norms that our TPAs uh, put together for us. They show us where we're in line, where we're out of line. So we get actionable data and we can we can put strategic uh, plans in place to address hot spots in our plan. And even as importantly, not screw up the things are going well, right? I mean, we, we, we want to make educated decisions. So that, you know, that transparency leads to the flexibility, which again leads to the control. The last two, I think they're important, but they're probably the, the two least important bullet points on the on the slide here. And I'm, maybe I'm missing the boat there, but you know, you, you do get to avoid some state mandates. Um, you get to simplify your plan. Uh, you know, when you have employees in multiple states, uh, really simplifies your plan. Avoid premium taxes. Uh, you know, there are some special taxes that, that came out with Obamacare, healthcare reform, 10, 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, that, that self-funded plans get to avoid. So, you know, again, kind of put the burden on the small middle employer, the large employers got to escape that burden. So I hope I run over my time. Those are my thoughts, Millie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and believe it or not, employers do worry a whole lot about compliance. So, so it's good to know that they, they would avoid those mandates. Uh, please advance this slide. Thank you. <laughs> Cody, this graph is from Kaiser Family Foundation, and he says that more than two thirds of all workers are covered by a self-funded plan. And Patrick and Doug talked a little bit about it. Can you tell us more about this trend? Absolutely, absolutely. So you guys, um, you know, participated in the poll that Patrick had up, um, where we asked, you know, how many American workers do you think are covered under some form of a self-funded plan. Um, and you know, it, it does come as a shock when you do discuss these numbers with, with um, employer groups and, and sometimes even brokers and people that are in, in the segment, but, but it is sitting at 67% of American workers now have self-funded health plans. And that number is, is continuously rising. Um, and, and a lot of that goes back to what David just hit off of. Um, you know, a lot of employers are, are sick of, of the rat race when it comes to 
um, you know, fully insured uh, renewal cycles, um, trend, because you hear that word a lot when you're fully insured, um, and, and just getting hit over the head with the renewal year after year, even when you're told that your claims ran well, uh, but you don't have that data to look at. So, you know, obviously you can see on this graph, a lot of the, the larger groups are going to be where you see the higher segment of being um, self-funded. That's because they got into self-funded, you know, a while back when it came to the marketplace. Um, they're comfortable with it. They've got enough finances to know that if, if a big claim does roll through, <clears throat> they can handle it and, and they're going to be paying less than what they would be if they were, you know, fronting to a fully insured carrier. You can see that, you know, as you get towards the smaller groups on the left side, um, the, the numbers start to decrease a little bit. But I will tell you from our personal experience and, and just from, um, you know, being in the market, these numbers are vastly increasing, um, especially on the smaller group segment. And there's a number of reasons that contribute to that. But I think the main thing that, you know, what, what we focus on and what David just hit on a lot of is, is in regards to the access to, to your data. Um, having access to your data allows companies to, to know what their insurance premiums are actually paying for, let alone it justifies what your renewal cycle looks like. If you don't have that data, um, you know, you're getting hit over the head with the renewal. You have no idea if it's justified. Um, you don't have the transparency. A, a lot of those things are pushing the smaller group segment to and, and at least explore self-funded as an option. Um, another thing that really is helping the smaller groups move towards self-funding or exploring is it exploring self-funding is there there's several mechanisms that can help um, smaller groups control their monthly spend or annual spend um, so they have that financial peace of mind when they are jumping ship from a fully insured plan. Um, there's several things that, that have already been mentioned on the call and I'm sure will continue to be mentioned, um, mm -hmm. such as, you know, a level funded plan where you have, you know, an exact monthly cost. You'll never exceed that if you do your, you know, stop loss carrier such as East Coast Underwriters is going to cover any claims that exceed that monthly number. Um, so, so it really gives the employers that financial peace of mind, knowing that they're not going to have to fund all of these massive claims if they do end up having a bad month. Um, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, when, when you compare to a fully insured plan and a self-funded plan, once you really start to unbundle, which is the focus here, um, there is a potential reimbursement if you do have, you know, a, a plan year that does run profitably for your employer group. Um, from ECU's point of view, if, if you have, um, you know, cl if claims, if you still have leftover money in your claims bucket at the end of a policy period, those, that money is 100% the groups to keep, regardless of if you go back to fully insured or renew self-funding. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that are driving this smaller segment to look to uh, move and or explore self-funding. Yes, and it was talked about earlier how it's not just about lowering your costs. You know, you want to be able to better your total uh, rewards, right? To be able to offer better um, exactly. uh, plans and just bene better benefits to your employees. So, so yes. Exactly. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the myths. You know, these, these are some of the reasons why um, companies shy away from doing self-funded. So uh, Cody, I'll start with you. You just, you know, talked about this, but do only very large companies self-fund? Right. And so, you know, we kind of just hit on this on the on the last slide and you saw that the numbers for for the larger companies, you know, there's a, a higher majority of them that are self-funded. Um, but that, that you can see that the smaller numbers are vastly increasing um, from what they used to be. I believe in 2013, that small to mid-sized segment was sitting at about 13 percent and now it's roughly in the 30s. So it, it's vastly increasing. And, and the reason for that are the mechanisms that I mentioned. The market is ever evolving. And so stop loss carriers such as myself, you know, we realized that there had to be product offerings that made those small groups comfortable in exploring those options. Um, so so it, it used to be, you know, one of those things that a lot of people just thought it was reserved for larger cash cow companies that can absorb a massive claim when it does roll through. But there are mechanisms now in which can make smaller groups and mid-sized groups uh, much more comfortable in knowing that, that they have financial peace of mind. And I, that's exactly what our employers want to hear. Um, myth number two, do employees have extra cost when their employers go self-funded? 
So this is another one that, you know, kind of, oh, yeah, sorry, that, that also leads back to, you know, having the data and the transparency and, and access to all of those things. Um, you know, typically um, savings on a self-funded health insurance plan compared to fully insured plans range anywhere from 10% to 35%. Now that depends on your plan design, um, your repricing strategy that you decide to go with, uh, your additional cost containment that you would like to tack on, and, and essentially just how aggressive you want to be with your self-funded plan. Um, so, so those savings can range vastly. Um, but as mentioned, you know, on the previous slides, there are ways to, to cap and know exactly what your annual max spend would be. And those numbers oftentimes are still coming in 10 to 35% below what a fully insured carrier would quote you as your annual spend. Um, a, a lot of this divulges into the flexibility of, of your plan design and, and tacking on additional cost containment, um, things of that nature. But, but really it just allows, having that data allows the group to dive in. And again, you know, I hit back it, know what you're paying for and know that your premiums are actually justified um, based off of that data. So, um, that there typically are not extra costs when you when you do go self-funded. Yeah, if anything, um, we talked about the power of zero, so um, it's going exactly. to even lessen the out-of-pocket expenses that employees may encounter. Excellent, thank you. David, myth number three, is it true that providers deny access to those who self-fund? Well, Samili, I sometimes have a hard time following the rules just like completely. <laughs> I'd love to tack on to myth number two and that, you know, we're not lining up plans on a spreadsheet. You know, there's not the same incentive as everyone on this call's experience to move across the spreadsheet to the right and raise deductibles, raise co-pays. You know, you, you get some little return on the fully insured market, but you get very little juice for that squeeze on the self-funded market. So our clients routinely actually have better plans self-funded uh, still control cost, mm -hmm. and then you talk about the cost containment programs where you can have no cost surgical, potentially no cost drugs. I mean, gosh, you know, our, the employee satisfaction with these plans is no different, maybe better. So myth number three: deniers, uh, you know, providers deny access to self fund. Well, for the most part, providers have no idea. I mean, they don't really know if you're self funded, fully insured. They don't know if you work for a five-person employer or a 50,000-employee company. So I think this is just a huge myth. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, most of the folks who self-insure, you know, they're still going to have some type of network, you know, some type of access, some type of a group of physicians, doctors, facilities that they have access to, um, and there's some agreement in place. So they're going to deny a customer who walks in. And, and I would even challenge you on some of the more aggressive models where, you know, how many businesses, how many folks out there among our participants are going to deny someone who's willing to come in and pay a fair price for your good or service. So we, we just don't see that. Excellent. Um, what about myth number four? Do self-funded plans put the employer at risk? Well, that is the biggest <laughs> belief. And that's been the biggest barrier, in my opinion. Well, one, the stop loss market, just the, the markets behind and, and their creativity and offering options that worked and reduced the volatility, uh, acted as a proper shock absorber for those small to medium sized businesses. Well, you know, the market's there now. So those products, those options are available. Um, so they, do they put the employers at risk? Well, you talk about a level funded. You know, you, you pay at the max risk every month. You, you know exactly what you're going to pay. Um, in a, a more traditional self-funded model, maybe a captive shared risk arrangement, you know, it's the model really that gives me the exact number. I know exactly what's the most I can pay in a year. Um, I can often have a reinsurance contract that tells me exactly what can happen on my renewal next year, an exact maximum rate increase. Um, so. I think it's the, you know, I've flipped my way of thinking on this. You know, my first 10, 15 years in the business, I was very unsure and certain. I shared this same myth number four for sure. I believe that. Um, but today, I think it's the only way to actually control your risk. Frankly, you know, I think, uh, and I love this phrase I picked up from one of our captive partners, that fully insured 
is not in, it's not insurance, it's not insured, it's deferred. So whatever happens this year, you pay for next year. And self-funded, I think we actually have more control and more control of our risk in a properly structured self-funded arrangement. Properly structured, you said it well, thank you. Uh, please advance. So we talked about the benefits, the reasons why you should. Let's talk a little more about what the funding options are. Cody, if you can help me explain um, some of the different options that companies have to safeguard and protect their cash flow. Absolutely, absolutely. So you can kind of see this is, um, you know, what I like to call a little bit of a stepping stone model here. Um, so, you know, we'll start off on, on the, the far left of the screen, which which is your, you know, fully insured, um, you know, no unbundling, no nothing. You 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 pay for what you get in, in that model. Um, and, and so you can see, you know, your network in, in a model like this is going to be, um, you know, one probably one of, you know, what we call your, your Buka networks, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, um, you know, something of, of that nature. Claims admin, same exact thing. It's going to be all through the same carrier. Um, your, your insurance and risk, you're, you're all tied into a carrier risk pool, essentially. Um, so, you know, transparency. Ha ha ha! Not not much of anything there. You're probably not going to get anything at all when it comes to transparency, when it comes to data, um, anything of that nature. Proactive programs, uh, nil. There, there's there's nothing there when it comes to that nature. Um, so something David and I actually spoke about yesterday, which I think you know kind of hits home for for this side of the model, um, and and really goes to show that the transparency piece is you know david mentioned a story to me and for a group that he worked with and you know renewal for for year one comes around groups in a fully insured model um they don't perform well you know they had a bunch of claims they were told that they had a lot of claims they never really saw the data uh, but they were told their loss ratio you know that sort of thing and so then they get hit with a renewal and you know they they the carrier has told them, hey, your renewal is based because of your claims data, right? On year one, you, you guys performed poorly. Year two comes around, they're told the exact opposite. They're told that they performed really well, they had a great loss ratio, everything was good, but still no data to back that. But then when the renewal comes around, they're getting hit with, you know, what, what's called a trend renewal in the marketplace, anywhere from 7 to 12, 15 percent in that range, depending on how their carrier risk pool has run. and mm -hmm when david goes back to the employer group and asks them you know well last year you rated our renewal based off of our claims how come this year it's not rated that way well then the carrier comes to you and says well your claims and your experience is not credible this year but in the previous year it was so just a little example of how they can kind of work it two sides however they want to, to get the renewal that they want um, and a lot of that is based off of the the insurance slash risk column there where it shows that it's you're in a carrier risk pool if their overall pool runs poorly, you can expect that you're going to be getting hit with a large renewal um, increase just based off of that pool alone. So then moving to the next stepping stone here, this is where you would get into, um, you know, level funded with the carrier ASO. So going to be very similar um, to, to the previous. This one's just kind of going to kind of uh, give you a little bit more transparency. Um, this, this would be a model that would probably give you what we call a premium versus claims report and then a large claimant report. Um, and so that would just show you who some of your large claims are in your employer group and then kind of map out what your actual loss ratio is when you compare your collect or your, you know, provided premiums compared to the claims that have been incurred. Very minimal data. Uh, majority of the time, a lot of the claimants are de-identified. So it's not like you would really be able to divulge on that, try and figure out how to mitigate some of those claims input programs that would help get rid of those claims um, so again the transparency is, is just not going to be there um, and you're still in that carrier risk pool where if that performs poorly you better believe that you're going to be getting hit with a, a decent size renewal so then if you move on to the next next step here that would be you know self-funded um, with an a aso arrangement and having soft loss tied in um, so, so you would get the stop loss component, you know, from, from the likes of East Coast Underwriters or, or any carrier of that nature. Um, but then you would be with, you know, in a carrier PPO network like the, the Blue Crosses, Aetna, Cygnus, like I mentioned, you would be under that TPA arrangement. So when you're under that arrangement, you can't unbundle things. And, and we've hit on it a lot, but a very important factor on, on our end in underwriting and on claims control 
comes to the, the RX piece. And so that's with your PBMs. Um, and so when, when you can't unbundle things like that, there's, there's rebates that are going back to, you know, the national carrier, there's rebates that are going back to that PBM. You, you really can't get very aggressive on that side of things. Um, there's some transparent, a little bit more transparency and a little bit of control. Um, but a lot of the time those carrier ASO arrangements are going to allow you to fully unbundle um, and, and get as aggressive as you would like. So, you know, the last stepping stone here is, is you know, mentioning self-funded with a independent TPA um, and stop loss. And so, you know, your repricing strategy, you guys can choose that. It can be a regional network that might have really good discounts. It could be a direct contract uh, through your broker, um, you know, with, with surgical centers, things of that nature. So you really can unbundle in these arrangements and, and get as aggressive as you want. If you know you've got a couple of employees that have some ongoing issues, you can work with your broker and your stop loss carrier to implement some cost containment um, that could mitigate a lot of those claims, um, which subsequently gives you a sustainable renewal cycle um, and, and puts you on a path of, of least resistance and more control as we hit off of just previously and, and you know busted a few of those myths that are that are prominent in the marketplace. Um, so again, you know, it just gives you the 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 ability to have an independent TPA stop losses outside of it. You can pick your PBM, um, you know, lots of proactive programs and, and getting to that is is absolutely the end goal as you have more control, flexibility, and, and much more transparency. So that very last model is the most flexible. So um, David, before, <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about that slide. No, Thank Cody you. knocked out of the park. Okay, excellent, please advance. So David, so um, help me explain this one. So uh, it, from what I understand, this is a captive model. So this is one of self-funded option, right? Sure, sure. This is a this is a model we do a lot of work with. Um, you know, so when you're self-funded, um, you know, you get the, the transparency, all the control, everything, but you're also, you know, rebuilding your plan. And in an effort to not over complicate this, you know, a lot of our clients that are making the transition from fully insured to self-insured, you know, we model and mirror a lot of what they have. And if you say, well, gosh, you know, well, this is so defective what they have. Well, you know, we do have to measure the change at times. So, you know, we can put something in place that's very comfortable for the employees. Uh, from their standpoint, kind of looks and feels similar. On the back end, though, the financial arrangement, and I'm reaching to my computer, which I just realized you can't see, so my pointer's uh, useless here. Um, but in this model, you know, you have insurance, as I spoke of earlier, that sits behind the scenes that protects you from either, you know, one large claim or an aggregating amount of smaller claims. So the blue here in this model is what you retain. So on the left side, this is the specific, you know, any specific claim, you have a limit. And, you know, for a lot of folks on this call, that limit could be, you know, 30, 35, 40, $50,000. So any particular claim that anyone has uh, through the year, you pay or your TPA processes the claim pays on your behalf up to say $35,000. That employer, that member has claims that go above 35,000. If you're in a captive arrangement where you're in a pool of, of other like-minded employers from, you know, maybe as uh, maybe 25 to as many as 500 employers who are the more progressively uh, thinking minded employers um, who are pulling the rope uh, in the same direction, um, you know, idea sharing, best practices. When you're in that type of pool, part of the dollars that you pay in for your risk protection are shared among the members. So the next layer of claims is either paid 100% by the captive share dollars or in, in one of our models, it's actually shared with the reinsurance carrier at a rate of 40% paid by the pool and 60% paid by the reinsurance carrier, all the way from your specific deductible up to a million bucks. Over a million bucks, it's completely transferred out of the pool uh, to the reinsurance carrier. So the other way that the insurance protects you is going across the bottom. As claims accumulate among all of your employees and all of your dependents and members, <clears throat> if you were to reach, there is a claims maximum, absolute defined maximum that you can spend. If you reach that maximum, then the captive risk 
picks up maybe on a shared basis with the reinsurance carrier or fully 100 percent they pick up all the claims incurred by all of your members no matter how small or large for the remainder of the plan year and that's what i spoke of earlier where you have an absolute defined maximum that you can spend now anything less than that maximum are dollars that you kept in your pocket and in the in the level funded model, which can really work well for the smaller employers, there's usually some shared, as Cody mentioned, some shared you know, division of those savings. In the more traditional self-funded model, um, you get to keep, uh, you know, I like, maybe as Dr. Bricker or someone said earlier, you know, I like to save 100% of the ER visits didn't happen. Well, you get to save 100% of the claims that are not incurred, that fall below the maximum. Uh, in this self-funded model. So, you know, that could be getting, um, you know, a little deeper than people really care to, to on this call in this short session. The point is, behind the scenes, you know, your employees are going to get a car. They're going to get folks that they can see. They're going to have benefits that often look very similar to what they're familiar with. Um, they may have benefit enhancements where they can go particular places and uh, have procedures for free. So, you know, who can argue with zero? Um, they're going to have a pharmacy benefit that still allows them uh, great access to pharmacies, um, but we're going to advocate for them for every patient assistance program that's available for these high cost drugs. And we're seeing a conversion rate of 70 plus percent of these high cost specialty drugs the cost is being moved off the plan. Those are huge, huge, huge dollars. And the employee still gets their specialty drug in the mail every 30 days, just like they did without the program. So, you know, we do a great job of overcomplicating this at times, but, you know, understand that the entrance into this model is going to look and feel reasonably similar to your employees. You know, I don't want HR on the call to freak out here today. It's just incredibly disruptive. This is usually a building block process. You know, we're adding a strategy per year. We're digesting it as we can, uh, as we can roll this out. So hopefully that gives a, a you know, just a, again, not too deep, but a deep enough overview of what you're buying behind the scenes and understanding, again, to, to uh, Doug's point, that you're not gonna have to pay a million bucks for that, that cancer patient that you have. Yeah, thank you, David. So I'm getting some questions here. Um, I think we talked about what will be the minimum um, employees or eligible employees or enrolled employees. Can we talk about who will be a good fit as far as the small employer? How many people do they need and who is this a good fit for? Sure, Cody, why don't you take the level funded and I'll jump into the captive. Yeah, so um, so it, it really depends on the statutory guidelines um, when it when it comes to, to minimum enrolled. Um, so so that that's the biggest thing that we would have to look into. I believe for the state of North Carolina, um, for a self funded health plan, it is um, 25 enrolled or sorry, 25 eligible employees. Um, and then outside of that, when you're working with, with a self-funded carrier, um, oftentimes there are participation requirements. So if you have 25 eligible lives um, and let's say you only have, you know, 10 enrolled, um, you know, there may be some carriers that, that would look to, to quote your 10 enrolled employees on a self-funded plan since you meet the 25 eligible um, threshold. But um, a lot of the times, like I said, there are participation requirements internally at ECU. Um, our, our carrier guidelines state that we have to have at least 51% participation um, in the self-funded plan with the other 49% being um, valid waivers. So just, just some small tidbits to keep in mind. Um, but again, I believe the state of North Carolina is 25 eligible employees in order to have a self-funded plan. And, and Melly, to, to really start looking at the captive, you know, 50, 50 plus enroll really starts to open the opportunities for you. Uh, there's no hard cap on the upside. You know, it, it's like at, at, at 301, it's completely useless. That's just not the case. But 51 is where you can really start having that conversation. And I saw a dog popped up. That makes me yeah. nervous. We've got two, <laughs> slides, two slides to go. Are we going to get there? 
Mm -hmm. Needs time, maybe a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Cody, I'd like to give you an opportunity. Next slide, please. To talk quickly about the difference between this one and the one that David just talked about. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I'll just quickly walk through this. David hit on a lot of the pointers that I would be going through for, for this slide. Um, so it's going to be very, very similar to what David just hit on. Um, on the left side there, you'll see the, the specific limit, you know, it's set at that, the top of the orange box on, on the left side going, going upwards. Um, and, and so that's going to be your, your individual limit, as, as David mentioned. For some of the smaller groups, that could be anywhere from 20,000 um, per employee all the way up to, you know, 100,000 and, and north of that if you have a larger employer group. Um, then on the bottom right, you know, that's going to be your, your total claims for all of your employees. The one thing I do want to hit on the mat side of thing is, is when you, you know, a carrier such as myself or an underwriting entity. Um, so they're going to underwrite and you see the middle line there on that bottom says expected total average year. Um, that's your expected total claims. What the, what the underwriter is then going to do is they're going to put a, a threshold on top of your expected claims in the case any catastrophic claims do occur, anything that, that we didn't catch in underwriting, um, you know, a cancer claim and any, anything big like that could pop up. Typically that threshold or corridor as it's called in the market um, is anywhere from 15 to 25%. Um, so here this model is showing a 20% threshold. For a self-funded plan, when you go truly unbundled, that last step that I mentioned on two slides back, when you're really unbundled, your plan isn't to get to expected total claims or to be under the you know um the, the total 120 percent there that far right line your plan is to try and be 20 percent lower than the expected total because when you get to that threshold or you're in between there and at the expected total at the end of the policy period there is going to be your benefits for your employer group um, as far as getting refunds back on on premiums or or claims payments that didn't you know, never, never processed. So guess what? All of that unspent claims fund is yours as the groups to keep. So I just, I just want to hit off that just a touch further, but the further that you unbundle, the more aggressive that you get, um, the, the more transparency that you gather as, as a plan, as, as an employer group, um, it, it's much easier for you to implement things and work with your broker um, to get some suggestions on things to implement, to try and get that claim spend down to, you know, 20% or even further below what that expected total would be. Well, thank you both Cody and David for collaborating with us during this session. Dr. Bricker said it best earlier, you don't have to boil the ocean, but you could and should take baby steps to improving your plan. So do not be afraid to explore the better place. Thank you. So, Ellie, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Cody's story. Our client moved self-funded. They said no to that trend. No to that single digit rate increase. Went self funded, saved $175,000 their first year, got 110 employees on the plan. That is real money that makes a difference in your business. Amen. Thank you so much, David and Thank Cody. You. Great session, Millie. Great session. All right, let's Thank transition you. quickly right now over to our next session. Hear from some providers, actual so pharmacists, a doctor, uh, et cetera. So I'm going Tee up Patrick and let Patrick and, and his team of, of, of specialists and experts take it away. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, and thank you, Millie and Cody and, and David for uh, a, a, a whirlwind tour of self-funding and, and strategies. I thought y'all did a great job. It's, it, you know, I think David said it great uh, that uh, we don't want it to appear more difficult than it is. You do it one step at a time. Y'all did a great job explaining it. Um, and again, all these slides are available to you uh, after the show. So, um, so my name is Patrick Long. I'm president and founder of Hero Health. And I'm, I get the great uh, good fortune of, of introducing uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ben Aiken uh, up in uh, Asheville area. Uh, before we get to Dr. Aiken, um, I, I owe a credit for this uh, cartoon below that a lot of people have commented on that they really like it. Uh, I guess it hits home with a lot of decision makers on this call in C-suites across North Carolina. They feel, uh, and this came from one of our clients after a few months, he it was during enrollment actually that he told his employees that um, somebody said, why are we changing from a familiar logo, I won't name, uh, to Hero? And he said, because we're sick and tired 
of being on this merry-go-round. Every two, three years, we change from Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, and then back again, and, and it, nothing changes. We don't have any control. And so he said, I was tired of the merry-go-round. So we made a cartoon out of that, and a lot of people have, uh, I guess it hits home with a lot of folks. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, please. So I I wanted to introduce Ben, but I wanted to, he's a hes a, a, a humble, uh, if I had his resume, I wouldn't be so humble. Well, I'll leave it there. Um, ben is a family physician, a husband, father of a couple of two kids uh, up in Asheville. Uh, he's a founder of Lantern Health, a, a nationally recognized uh, a DPC uh, clinic up in the mountains. Uh, he's also co-founder of 3 by 5 Health, which is creating and supporting a national collective of local direct primary care practices by connecting them to employers um, and, and that want to invest in the health and well-being of their employees, businesses, and their communities. So you've heard this recurring theme today of, of community-owned health, uh, bringing it back local. Uh, just about everyone on our uh, conference today has mentioned in some way a perspective of, of Main Street over Wall Street and bringing it back and taking back control locally. Uh, ben is one of those leaders. He's been out there on the forefront of this. He grew up over the mountains in Tennessee, uh, graduated from UNC here in Chapel Hill uh, before pursuing his career in family medicine. He worked on the faculty uh, before founding uh, Lantern. And I asked him what really drives him, and he said, I seek to re redefine the experience of primary care and transform healthcare to work better for everyone, uh, so people, plans, and providers. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Dr. Aiken. I know you're a busy man, but uh, thanks for making time for us. Uh, did I leave anything out of that? I know that was a... Uh, you're very yeah. kind, Patrick. I appreciate the introduction. Well, we're very lucky to have you and, and full disclosure to uh, have uh, Lantern Health in our health plans. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, nationally recognized work that they do um, right here in North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Aiken, I just put up a slide of why DPC, why direct primary care. Before we dig into a kind of the contrast, can you define what in your words, how would you describe what you do? That's a really good question. I think um, at its core, DPC is a financial model. It's a different financial model for paying for primary care. And so at its basic level, it, it, it looks much more like a gym membership um, than a current fee-for-service model where every time you go in, there's a certain cost and a claim that's generated. Um, where where things, from my perspective, in addition to that shift and the incentives that it leads to um, become interesting is kind of what's included for that and how do you design that around a better consumer experience, providing better and higher quality care, having a more connected um, relationship, um, providing more time to your clients, all of those things that are kind of left out when you're in a fee-for-service system where uh, you basically kind of gear your entire practice to making sure that you're getting paid by the insurance company. Uh, yeah. So that, that's a really profound shift from an incentive perspective um, that starts to get to why, why DPC. Um, at just a higher level, it really is kind of taking some of those age-old values of what you think about when you think about the primary care that your grandparents had 50 plus years ago, where it's really built around a relationship, somebody that you know, you feel like it's part of your family. Yeah, that that's great. And I think many people on this call can uh, um, can identify with what you laid out. Um, one, uh, two things I wanted to mention, I just read a press release yesterday um, that Optum, uh, a big part of the largest uh, BUCA, uh, United Healthcare, announced plans to buy 10,000 physicians out this year. Um, 10,000 more. They already had 55,000 that work directly for the healthcare insurance company, right? So Optum's buying 10,000 physicians out. Um, and their revenues are now over 130 billion per year and soaring. Uh, so they have this huge money-making machine for physicians. It, it seems like, you know, and 10,000 doctors like you have are joining per year. 
are, you know, agreeing to opt out of, of, of being independent, um, that is, seems so different, so uh, contrasting to what you're talking about, about restoring community and bring, being back local. Um, can you speak to that trend and, and how, how different are you? How different are DPC doctors from this, um, this conglomerate? Indeed, yeah, we're we're quite distinct. I think if you, if you look at um, the number of the percentage of physicians coming out of residency and what percentage are going to work for either health systems or big conglomerates, it's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of physicians, uh, which is a really strikingly high number. Um, and as you suggest, if I if I work for ultimately for Optum and for United. Um, then the incentives that I kind of will operate on mostly gear around making sure that they're satisfied as my employer. Um, so the distinct difference in the direct primary care movement is my boss is really, there are my patients. Um, so there, those are both individual consumer patients, but also employees uh, and employers. So at the end of the day, if I don't do a good job or say what I'm going to do um, and follow through with that, I have to answer. Uh, you know, ultimately, my patients can fire me. It's as simple as that. So, it's a totally different incentive alignment um, in comparison to what you're describing. Uh, Percentage-wise, we still are a relatively niche, um, you know, percentage, you know, small percentage, um, probably, uh, you know, on the order of maybe two or three percent of all of primary care is delivered in a direct primary care model. But if you look at the growth over the last five plus years you start to see an exponential trend. Um, so uh, you know, I think what excites me is that perhaps, yes, there are 10,000 that are joining up with Optum, um, but I'm also willing to bet that there's 10,000 looking around and seeing the success and, and the re kind of regaining control that you see with DPC who are actively considering joining. So, uh, you know, from uh, probably somewhere around 50 clinics or so five plus years ago. I think we're closing in on maybe 1,500 nation, nationwide, um, and that number is growing, which is which is quite exciting. Yeah, to echo what Dave Chase said, uh, no successful healthcare system uh, on the planet uh, does not have uh, a strong DPC type model, right? So the fact that it's growing here is encouraging, and the alignment that folks like you have had with employers and, and cutting out the insurance. There is no insurance with DPC, right? So our plan agreed to pay you uh, a price, you know, and it ranges between 60 and $80 uh, typically in North Carolina uh, per month for unlimited access to you, right? And so, and your, and your colleagues in clinic. And so uh, it's a straightforward investment of typically less than 10% of the plan spend, right? So when I go to our clients that are Catapult members or not, go to them and say, you need to invest in better care. Who delivers 80% of your care roughly is the primary care doctor. But you're only getting 10% of the plan spend, but you're delivering four fifths of all the care. And that's a great investment. And it doesn't take long for a CFO of any size company to figure that out. Uh, and so we just have to get a better, we have to do better at telling the story and, and, and we're growing with your numbers. Like you said, you've gone from 500 to 1500 clinics, but maybe in our short amount of time, we could talk a little bit about the contrasting because so many people on this call are used to uh, typical or standard conventional primary care versus DPC. So I thought it might be good to just throw this little slide up and, and we could take a look at that. Um, I know from personal experience, uh, my primary care doctor calls me John uh, because my full name is John Patrick Long and he doesn't know me that I go by my middle name. So every I see him once a year for my physical for eight minutes maybe and four of those he's typing into a computer in the background, but he's calling me John the whole time. And when I start to interrupt him, it doesn't get through. So he's a great guy. I'm sure he's a good doctor, but he's got, as I mean, I think you told me some of these hospital systems expect them to have over 2000 patients on their panel. How could he possibly get to know me, right? Can you talk a little bit about how different your practice is with uh, employers and employees? 
Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's a really high, a good example that you share there. I think the the average panel size in a practice is somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000, as you suggest, in a conventional practice. Um, I've been in a conventional practice, and to keep the lights on, you have to see 25 or 30 patients in a day. And it really is such a, it's just a suboptimal experience for everybody. Uh, the doctors aren't happy. You have seven to eight minutes on average if you look at the amount of face-to-face -face time. Uh, you're seeing that many folks in a day. It's really hard to, I mean, it, it's pretty unrealistic to actually even address one thing in seven to eight minutes, uh, much less have a relationship where you know the right name to call the person, frankly. Uh, so uh, DPC really flips that all on its head. Um, as I uh, was getting into DPC, I was challenged by a fellow colleague who had transitioned more into the business side to really take, take the doctor hat off and put the consumer hat on in every decision that you make. And as I reflect now, several years in on, on DPC, so much of what uh, is attractive about it is, is just a much better experience um, at the end of the day. So we see on average, as you see there, kind of nationwide six to eight patients in a day. Um, the average panel size, the number of patients that a physician would carry is between six and 800. Um, and some, you know, probably around 700 average. Um, our shortest appointment time is 30 minutes. I regularly spend 60 to 90 minutes at somebody's initial appointment, really getting to know them and everything that could influence their health. There's really no need for a waiting room anymore because you get away from the volume game of having to turn a room over and have people waiting so that as soon as you're out of one room, you're in another room and seeing a patient so that you can maximize that volume and that revenue. Um, uh, and then the overwhelming majority uh, of DPCs really build in this kind of unlimited access model. So uh, you can come into our clinic just like you would a regular primary care clinic. We can do all the things that you would expect in a primary care clinic, whether that's testing you for strep or stitching up a wound or evaluating a rolled ankle or managing your diabetes or your blood pressure issues. Um, but we, there's no incentive for us to see you in person versus over video or over phone. Um, all of our patients can text us just like you can text a friend. Um, and those technologies have been around a while. We just haven't used them in healthcare, uh, but they make uh, an immense amount of sense. I think anybody perhaps on the call, especially leaders of, of businesses around the state, are likely to have a friend that's a physician and maybe have had that experience of being able to text that friend and ask a quick question. We just think that that should be available to everybody, um, all of your employees, and that's kind of how it's structured. And we do it in a way that's more secure than regular text, so it's HIPAA compliant. Um, the example I've shared, uh, and Patrick has heard this before that kind of caught me off guard, is shorter than two weeks into the practice, I had a patient a video in from underneath their covers in bed at home. And at first I was a little taken aback, frankly, but they had likely the flu and felt terrible, and that's really where they wanted to be. And we were able to have an initial consultation over 10 to 15 minutes, talk it through, figure out a plan, and ultimately arrange follow-up without them ever having to leave their house. Um, so it, it really builds in telemedicine, the kind of the need for a separate telemedicine plan ultimately just goes away. Um, and one other thing I'll speak to is um, you know, just that what time allows as well from a prevention perspective. Um, so when you really have time to dig in and look at root cause of things or talk about, you know, the food you eat or how you sleep at night or your stressors or other things, the social determinants that people talk about, um, we really are able to address things um, without needing to refer out much more. Um, so I've now had uh, more than one person I've diagnosed with diabetes who is no longer diabetic, not even pre-diabetic, and we never actually even touched a medicine. We just spent time talking about what they eat and how they move and exercise and those types of things. So it really re-incentivizes and, and it re-incentivizes things uh, towards a much better experience for both the provider and the and the the employee uh, and the employer, um, and does so in a very transparent and predictable way. Um, yeah. So uh, it's really in kind of solve so many of the pain points that we see with with status quo primary care yeah the the expectations we've been so bullied and beaten by the system that it's so refreshing i mean you you shouldn't even have to say this that you post your prices that things are transparent i mean you know right. it's like somebody likened it to the the a restaurant 
taking all the prices off the menu would who would eat there well that's like God, that's the status quo right i have good friends who are doctors some of them in Asheville, and i asked them how much is an mri and they're like i don't know well you're a radiologist they're like don't get me started i don't know the pricing there's like 400 prices that i i, I wish i could be transparent but i can't it's the system is so crazy and, and that's right you you just you know it's it's kind of crazy that we're bringing it back to I would say Marcus Welby or date myself, but bring it back to, um, you know, like you said, like our parents or grandparents would have expected to have a family doctor, right? Uh, and that's, it's it's simplifying, it's restoring, it's not disrupting as much, right? That's what you're doing, like Dave Chase talked about. I had some numbers here and I wanted to get your reaction to them and then we can wrap up, but um, uh, these are national numbers. And, and so if you could give me your opinion on these, uh, direct primary care members experience 60% fewer ER visits. That's huge. I mean, anybody who's a fiduciary for a plan knows that that's the hardest thing to deal with when we know that, you know, north of 50% of ER visits are unnecessary, unwarranted. And here you are uh, uh, taking it down as a, as a primary care doctor who's got a relationship with that member, taking that gross number down by 60%. Um, you know, I know you don't see all the things you, we don't, we don't pay the bills we never get. Right. So you're, it's, it's kind of a out of the box score, but that's an amazing number that mm -hmm. client, that members of practices like Lantern just don't go to the ER nearly as much by more than half. Um, I think that's super important that in and of itself, that pays for your year. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm a CFO of a company listening in today, I'm like, we just paid for a year of great care with a with our with just that, because a year of of Dr. Aiken is going to be roughly what like roughly uh, 800 bucks or so somewhere in that neighborhood, and that's you know probably uh, a quarter of an emergency or a third of an emergency room visit. <laughs> so that's an amazing uh, number. Um, oh, nearly half. Uh, fewer referrals to specialists. Uh, we all know that that they can be hugely expensive. Um, somebody said earlier that uh, the most ex the most ex uh, expensive words in all of healthcare are "that's right down the hall" um, and, uh, and and seeing another specialist and another specialist. But you don't do that, like you said, you don't do that kind of referring because you can handle so much of that, or your staff can. You know, you have you have complementary colleagues. And fewer, almost by two thirds, fewer uh, imaging uh, exams. So we all know that the traditional primary care doctors are owned by those systems or owned by those carriers that make more profit when premiums go up. And so they're incentivized to gin up more revenue. And, and what's easier than running a few extra MRIs? Um, and you just don't get that, right? You only do the necessary things. I can't believe I have to say that, but, uh, but that's what you do. You do what's necessary, right? Um, do, any, anything along those lines that you want to share with us about the type of care and, and how you keep it in the, in the room there? Yeah, I think all those examples, I mean, those kind of statistics you share are really insightful. Um, I think it's important to highlight that kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, those types of things aren't necessarily coming kind of to the forefront of the provider i can see some people saying oh well, you know what are you kind of your pain and direct primary care doc to kind of limit your options um, if you will but it's really all of those things just become the natural incentive pattern uh, because i have a really deep relationship with somebody and if i'm going to send them somewhere i want them to get the highest value at the lowest cost because if they end up having a bad experience they're going to come back and they're going to call me on it because we have that close and deep relationship um, just like the employer would as well. Um, you know, I think because, it, you know, ultimately so much of uh, primary care is a relationship, um, a lot of it relates to lifestyle, behavior change, trust, and those types of things. And when you have time and the ability to really get under the surface and know folks, um, you're able to really kind of decipher a whole lot. So a quick example is, you know, I have a uh, a patient that I know and have known for several years who regularly gets chest discomfort. 
Um, and in, if they walked into any urgent care or any typical primary care provider's office, they're going to be put in an ambulance and sent to the emergency room because they said chest pain. Yeah. Um, I know this person really, really well. And so I also know that there's a high level of anxiety underneath the surface and what testing we've done in the past. And so in and of itself, uh, that's quite a few emergency room visits that are avoided. You know, that person hasn't been to the emergency room in several years. Yeah. Uh, another example is somebody who tore their knee up, uh, an employee who had an MCL and an ACL tear. Um, we handled the imaging and got the imaging done for a very competitive um, you know, cash price on behalf of that uh, patient. And then we're able to help navigate the employer land a bundled contract for the surgical price. Uh, and ultimately, with that case alone, the entire business that has over 100 employees paid for all of primary care with us. Yeah. Um, it speaks to, to what you're sharing, uh, but it just becomes the, the, the easy kind of the, the path to go. It just becomes the default way that we'd operate as a practice. And our incentive is on the patient or the employee having the best experience possible. We want them to be as healthy as possible. Yeah. Um, and then the incentive also is us, we really want them to keep to keep them healthy because we have unlimited visits. If every one of my patients came every week, uh, we'd be uh, totally overwhelmed. Uh, that we, we wouldn't fly. So our goal is to keep you as healthy as possible so that you actually don't have to come and see us as much. Um, but we're also struck by the, the idea that if, if we're just trying to avoid caring for you, then you'll leave because, hey, it's a direct relationship. Um, and the employer will leave. So there's that really healthy balance and, and alignment in terms of trying to do right by patients um, and, I love that. and guide it. So uh, yeah, that's 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 great stuff. Uh, Tucker, can you advance one more slide? I forgot about this. Um, I've had this cartoon done, and it reminded me of you, Ben, <laughs> your practice, and uh, you know uh, what you're talking about. There really are great examples of control again, right? I keep coming back to that word. But the control, because that patient, that employer can fire you at any time. You can't, a, a patient can't raise their hand and say to the buka, I'm firing you, I'm not going to that hospital. You're under their control. But with, with these direct relationships, the patient is empowered, right? And, and, and that relationship is being developed. And so it's really extracting the insurance in this example, this little cartoon, but I think it's instructive. It, it's taking the insurance company out of the arrangement and saying it's got to be the doctor-patient relationship again, and that and that's that's critical. We kind of joke about it here, but it's absolutely how it really is with uh, with with primary care doctors such as yourself. And I, I, we got to go, but I wanted to give one more example. We had a real-world example. I don't know if it was yesterday or day before. I don't. We we talk. Uh, that one of our members uh, is going to be in need of a surgery, right? And it's not an emergency situation. But instead of like if it was a typical conventional DPC or a primary care, sorry, it would just go into the system, right? It'd be sent off to insurance who would steer it to a, a partner relationship with a facility. But instead, you contacted us and said, hey, he, the patient's fine, but, you know, we're going to have to schedule a surgery at some time. And that enabled our team to look up the highest quality score doctors um, and by location for that hernia operation. And then we just suggest that back to you, you're driving the bus, and then you and the patient make that decision. All Hero did was provide you with you know, top ranked doctors within a, a, an hour or two drive. And so that's the way it should be, right? All we're talking about here is if you were building this from scratch, this is the way it should be, right? This, why not? Why not do this? I mean, for our perspective, uh, it, it's a great way to practice because previously I had to say, hey, I'm going to send a referral and I have no idea how much it's going to cost you. I have no idea what your insurance is going to cover. It's just out to the ether. In this yeah. situation, hey, uh, I have an, you know, here's what you're, you should expect. Here's who to talk to if you have any questions about that. And here are the options that we have for really high quality, fairly priced um, places for you to go. So, it's really a win-win uh, from our perspective. Yeah. Too. Great opportunity. Well, we could talk for hours, but this was our limited amount of time today. Thank you, Dr. Aiken, so much for leading the way. I know you you spent a lot of time talking to other doctors about following this path and educating them about the high value of a lifestyle, a high return to your community, uh, and and uh, 
and all that direct primary care offers as a profession and also to the employers and employees, the working people of North Carolina and the ones that pay the bills, their employers, uh, it's hugely important. So thanks for sharing this uh, with us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for this opportunity and thanks to Catapult for uh, what you all are doing at a state level. Really exciting. Very exciting. Okay, thanks, okay. Dr. Aiken. We're gonna bring on uh, Vinay Patel. Um, and, oh, not Karen yet, there's Vinay. Okay, I'll try to get the order right. <laughs> okay, we're rolling now. Um, so, uh, Vinay Patel um, is uh, a pharmacist, uh, husband, father of two kids as well. This is a trend here. Uh, founder of Mako RX, uh, a, a unique uh, pharmacy benefits manager or PBM uh, for self-funded groups. He's worked in pharmacy settings, including national retail chains, local community locations, inside of hospitals, academics. Uh, Vinay is focused on population health, community-owned pharmacies, and with Mako RX, uh, creating a revolutionary firm that improves care for employers and working people in North Carolina and all over the country. Uh, Vinay, thanks for taking time out of your very busy schedule to share some ideas on how the mid-sized businesses on the call today might improve their pharmacy programs. I'll stop, take my breath, but ask you, did I leave anything out that was important there? Oh, you might, we have to mute, uh, you have to turn on your microphone. It has to turn green, the little um, on the. OK, you want to call in? OK, we'll give Vinay a second to uh, to try that. Um, I'll keep it going here by talking about um, this crazy slide and let Vinay, when he gets uh, on live, um, help us figure this out. This is not meant to give you a headache after lunch like it did me, but um, it, you know, it, it, it's what's out there right now when you try to map, how does a drug move, and you can see on the right-hand side, manufacturers, how does it move from a factory, uh, many of them in Wilson, North Carolina and thereabouts, how does it move from the, from the manufacturer uh, to your employee and all the things along the way that extract money out of that equation? And so um, it's a it's a mess out there with the traditional PBM. So um, let's see if if Vinay can get on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Sorry, technical no difficulties. Uh, yeah. So I was just saying, Vinay, that that you know we don't want to spend a ton of time on this because it's just a, a total mess. But this is the status quo map of what the folks on this call the executives that are paying for healthcare in North Carolina, this is where how the money flows. Uh, do you wanna add some commentary to this and then we'll move on to the good stuff? Yeah, so the, un, unfortunately, this is the complexity of the pharmacy supply chain under the status quo model. Um, and, and by the way, you see that, that little green dollar sign next to the pharmacy where they captured According to the, the slide, they captured $32. Most of that goes back to the PBM in the form of clawbacks. Uh, and so the pharmacy doesn't even get to keep that captured amount, or at least most of, of that captured amount. Uh, and so, you know, just a general flow, a manufacturer, whether it's multiple generic manufacturers across the world or one manufacturer like Pfizer or, excuse me, GSK, um, uh, or another branded manufacturer makes a medication, they make the drug, and it goes from that factory where they make the drug, which actually, uh, to your point, Patrick, you reminded us that a lot of these drugs are made in Wilson, North Carolina, uh, and, and that gets shipped to a wholesaler. Pallets of these medications get shipped to a wholesaler, and when a pharmacy needs one or two bottles for a patient, they order that from their wholesaler. So that's the drug flow. It gets manufactured, gets sent to a wholesaler, and then the pharmacy orders that from their wholesaler in small quantities for patients to, to serve their, their community. Uh, and then on the contracting side, you have insurance companies, pharmacy benefit managers, and plan sponsors or employers. That's really where the overages, the overcharges come from. Uh, that's where you have administrative fees and rebate dollars uh, and additional pharma dollars flowing back and forth 
and something unique called uh, spread pricing. So healthcare is unlike any other industry in the world that can have all of these sort of revenue streams going to people that uh, are sort of hidden or cloaked uh, behind this, uh, behind the curtain here. Yeah, uh, Dave Chase talked about it earlier. Part of Health Rosetta's mission was to sh shine a light on all of this. And uh, when they dug into the uh, legal contracts and the revenue streams of these PBMs, um, I think they 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 found upwards of 21. Uh, might the number might be higher, but at least 21 revenue streams for uh, inside of these from kickbacks and rebate percentages to clawbacks to overcharging to all that stuff, uh, you know, it, and, and it's a, it's an amazing amount of, uh, I, I said, it would make the Sopranos blush, you know, this type <laughs> of operation would make uh, the Sopranos very jealous. Uh, and yet this That's is right. the, the status quo for PBMs. And so, That's right. um, yeah, so uh, the, what I wanted to talk, so this is the status quo, right? All, uh, all yep. of today's lessons have been about status quo versus being proactive, status quo versus hero, um, taking back control and all of this. So, you know, how did you, a pharmacist that's worked in all these different settings from retail to academia, and how did, what's the mission behind this? What, what drives you as a CEO and founder of this company to change this stuff? This is pretty ingrained. Yeah, it is, it is. And to, to unfold this, to, to peel back the onion, uh, as you will, uh, took a lot of, of energy and time. And the reason that we do all of this is in all of the areas that I've worked in pharmacy, every single one of them is influenced by the invisible hand that is the pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, and they dictate what pharmacists are allowed to do, how, what they're allowed to say to patients, how much they get paid, uh, how, how they're allowed to take care of, of their patients to a certain extent as well. Uh, and we wanted to remove that influence, just like Dr. Aiken had mentioned, uh, that physicians are under the same sort of restrictions or, uh, uh, or, or constraints that insurance puts on them. Uh, we wanted to remove that for pharmacists. And so, and you know, as you mentioned, PBM is, is sort of this three-letter dirty word in the industry. We like to think of ourselves at MakeRx as a PBA. So we started with putting people plans and pharmacies first. And so we said in that order, we want, we're, we're healthcare providers, we want to make sure to take care of the people first. And what that means is uh, having, you know, having time and, and giving the pharmacies that are, that are the frontline care providers for these patients when they, after they see the doctor and go into the pharmacy to get their medication, the time and the space to allow to take care, provide high quality care and provide savings. We know we had to start with the story of savings. So we came to employers and said, we have this cost plus model, and we, the way we did that was, is we took uh, a, a contract with every single one of our 16,000 pharmacies and said, everyone's going to get paid the same. We're going to get paid for the cost of the drug plus a fixed valuable amount uh, that's charged on top just for their margin since we're paying the cost. Uh, and that's the model we came to. And we went to employers and said, we're going to help save you money first, and then we're going to come to you to come to the table and tell you why you want to have your employees use these high quality pharmacies that can spend extra time and energy just like Dr. Aiken in the direct primary care practices. So again, it, it's, it's a trend here. You're, you're taking something super complex, this Rube Goldberg machine that's been built over 50 years um, and, and all the 21 levers to drive profit back to Wall Street. And you just said, look, we're just gonna pay cost plus a fair margin. And it's, it's, really, right. simple. it's really simple. So I know that you cannot accept any uh, rebates or um, a percentage of discounts or contracted kickbacks or marketing fees or or script fees or and all these things we've seen it's a straight okay. PEPM you can look people in the eye and say dear employer of 50 or 500 employees um, we're going to be paid X um, that's it and and it's it's so simple. Right. But and what I really like about your model, too, is it's not at the expense of the service. In fact, the service we've experienced has been astronomically more uh, customer friendly to the point where you, as an experienced pharmacist with decades of, 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 of uh, leadership and experience under your belt, are calling the members to walk them through um, 
a step therapy or what's this branded drug side effects or um, how let's talk about a specialty drug or getting them off of a particular medication. Um, so right. the service is uh, tenfold over the status quo, yet your pricing is super transparent. How do, how do you do that? I guess, um, are you a nonprofit or are you, a, how are you, <laughs> how are you doing all this? So, uh, and so this goes back to our fo core philosophy. We want to be what's a, a steward of the plan for these employers. So we're a pharmacy benefits administrator. We come to the table with recommendations and we tell the employers, HR, CFO, CEOs, here's how you can design your plan and here's what that means. If you want to include uh, the, the $100,000 specialty product because you need to, because one of your employees is taking it, here's the impact on your plan and here's, how, here's the tools we have available to help you save on those costs. And so first and foremost, we're an administrator of the plan. We come back to the true definition of a third party administrator. We just process the claims. We advise and consult on the best ways to help the plan sponsor save money because we're just a processor. We help to process yeah. the claims and show you what that means and design the plan. Uh, and so we charge a PEPM for that. And then we come back to the table and say, because we can admit, because we keep things so simple, we're not just restricted to our local pharmacy network where we have a cost plus uh, uh, our wholesale direct pricing, we actually can mirror the plan. So today, if your employees pay $50, they walk into Walgreens. Tomorrow, when they walk into Walgreens, they'll pay $50 for that medication. And we make sure to mirror it to minimize the disruption and give you access to all the pharmacies. What we do is incentivize members when they choose local and they get lower cost sharing, lower co-pays there. That, that, that's an important, um, we've experienced in our plans with you is instead of you don't penalize, you incentivize, right? And so, like you said, if you go to Walgreens or Walmart, you pay the same for that drug, same cost out of pocket. But if you go across the street or down the road to Williams or Wilson, the locally owned pharmacy, um, you've you put together a program that a lot of our uh, members, all of our members love, and a lot of prospects are talking about. And that is 300 of the most prescribed generic drugs for zero out of pocket. So, so several people have mentioned the power of zero today. That's real stuff. When you when you tell a, a working person in North Carolina, um, you know, there's 300 generics for free to them uh, and a low cost to their plan. Uh, if But only if they buy it at a locally owned pharmacy. Uh, you're not penalizing them for going to Walgreens. It's convenient, um, but you're incentivizing them to go local. How how is that worked out? The feedback that we've gotten from the employer, the executive leadership at the employer groups uh, that we work with through Hero and the employees is an an overwhelming sense of thank you, thank you for giving me an option that I didn't I wasn't forced to use mail order or specialty pharmacy or, or go just to CBS. You gave me the choice and then you informed me that I could save money by choosing a local all, uh, and we've done a proactive campaign to reach out to every one of those members that could save more than $50 on their prescriptions a month. And every one of them has said, I've wanted to use my local pharmacy. I just I haven't been able to before under my status quo plan, either they were out of the network or they were charging me more when I go to use a local pharmacy. This gives me an option. I've always wanted to use a local pharmacy. Thanks for the, the choices and thanks for the options near me. Uh, and I'm going to be using a local pharmacy next month. Overwhelming, over 90% of the people who reached out to. Yeah, and, the, and what we also hear back is that's often the business owner. So the owner of the pharmacy is often the one filling the prescriptions. And, you know, no offense to the person working at the counter at the, at the local Walgreens or Walmart, but they don't really have a vested interest in, in the next next up, right? They're, they're you know, it's like a, a turnstile of employment there. But the locally owned pharmacist usually has 20 or 30 years experience. They're known in the community. Uh, they're going to tell you about your drugs. They're going to ship them for free to your office if, during COVID if, or home, if that's what you prefer. There's all sorts of services around that. And, and our, our members have really um, appreciated all of that. They, they couldn't believe that this existed, really. They've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, we've only got a few minutes, so I also wanted to address the plan. like. We've got a lot of CEOs and CFOs and HR people on this call today and pharmacy. I mean, this map of spaghetti craziness is, 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 is hard to decipher, 
And also, it's just such a big thing with the with drugs. How do you break it down into the tiers for us really quickly? Yeah, so, uh, so real quick, if you had to think about pharmacy in the simplest sense, there's three groups, tiers, or categories of medications. Generic medications where uh, more likely than not, uh, in your status quo plan today, you're getting overcharged as a plan sponsor, and pharmacies, unfortunately, uh, uh, local pharmacies are either getting paid very close to the cost of the drug with little margin or sometimes under the cost of the medication. And that spread pricing is what allows the status quo plans, yes. status quo plans on generic drugs to make so much revenue. Uh, and that is, that, that's, that's the generic category of bucket. Then you have the branded medications. And under the branded medications are insulins and um, medications for uh, mental health. Uh, and uh, these medications are, again, rebate dollars drive what's on the formula here. We take an approach to make sure that if there's a generic available in a class, that the generic gets tried first, so the members at the pharmacy counter get savings, and the plan get savings up front rather than having to wait months for the rebates. But we also have access to rebates as well uh, through this formulary. And then we got specialty drugs, which are the ultra high expensive drugs, over $1,500 a month. Uh, and we have tools and, and uh, services available to help mitigate those costs as well. Well, Vinay, thank you so much for all you're doing. I'm sorry we're, we're running out of time, but um, okay. we, had to, we had to cut it a little short. But it's an amazing, um, uh, it's working, right? This is working across North Carolina. It's helping um, thousands of North Carolinians today. So thank you very much for all you're doing at Mako RX and, and adding clarity and transparency to the drug programs. We look forward to talking to you again really soon. And I know we're, we're running a little bit late, but we're going to get Karen Simonton on. Um, Karen, thank you Fantastic. for joining us from uh, just north. And uh, uh, is it Lynchburg, Virginia? Oh, you got to do the, uh, you're muted. You got to click on the green microphone. There, on. Go. there you go. You're in. Go. So yes, Karen, um, yes, thank you so much. Um, Karen is a, a nationally known uh, powerhouse full of energy everyone says uh, she's a super connector uh, one of those people that just seems to already know everybody uh, there's like one degree of Karen uh, everyone I, I seem to meet in this ecosystem is a, is a friend already or has heard of Karen Simonton and and Karen can you tell us what do you do with the ortho forum and why is this part of this move to value and this company control uh, that we've been talking about here today? Absolutely. So I'm a 30 year veteran of independent uh, collaborative practice, and uh, most of it has been spent with orthopedists. So after leaving Ortho Virginia as their chief financial officer, I went to work for the Ortho Forum, which is a national membership organization of 4,700 musculoskeletal providers. So think orthopedics, sports trained primary care, physiatry, um, sometimes neurosurgery, anesthesia, and then all of the therapy elements under that, physical therapy, occupational therapy, ATCs, anyone who's working in that musculoskeletal space, sometimes to even include rheumatology, these 4,700 physicians are uh, in 150 different musculoskeletal groups, all vertically integrated and collaborative care models in 47 states. So it's a great opportunity to raise visibility of independent physicians, uh, much like Dr. Aiken, and yeah. connect them with employers in the communities where they are living and working and civicing and raising children and doing all of the things that all employers are doing in the community to try to lift the standard of living for the uh, constituents of those of those beautiful places in our United States of America. That's great. Well, I know that um, you know there's a, there's a couple of filters before you can get to work with with your group or that you seek out as as partners. And I just put up one example here. Um, one of our partners, uh, our premier partners in uh, Hero Health Plans in North Carolina is Ortho Carolina. And I know you're very familiar with them. Um, and, and what we, you know, uh, we don't have enough time to really dive in, but we're going to just talk about this example because I think we can, with your help, we can understand better how in the world uh, does it cost so much to go so one place? And I have the example up there of a, of a big hospital, and or or go to an uh, ortho form member, ortho Carolina in this case, 
uh, right down the street where you park and walk in, by the way. Um, and, and you get a great doctor. You could get a, the same doctor sometimes at both locations, right? Um, but, the, but these high quality doctors that have been, you know, extra training under a fellowship, uh, members uh, elected to uh, College of Surgeons, and so elected by their peers to be top performing in their in their specialty. Um, these doctors, um, you know, have high, better outcomes over time. We see a lot of data. We see a lot of readmission rates and things like that. Ortho Forum is very selective, and and Ortho Carolina, I know, has top doctors, as do other facilities here in, in North Carolina. But I just wanted to show this one example because on the call today, we have a lot of true payers, I call them. These are the CA, CAEOs, CFOs, and HR people that are actually paying the bills, unlike a lot of the big carriers that are middlemen. And, and, and I just broke down this one example from one of our members, um, and I thought we should talk about it. So I don't know if you can see at the bottom there, but it has, you know, if, if this doctor, I think I could identify him, Dr. Howe. He's, uh, by all of our quality scores, he had the highest quality score in all of uh, Winston-Salem. And we had a member that needed uh, two knee replacements uh, in Winston-Salem. They're a catapult member. Uh, they're also a client of Hero Health. And one of their uh, foremen needed two re knee replacements. In the old days, last year, uh, they would have crossed the street and gone to the big neon sign of a branded hospital. and the, they would have gotten a good doctor, no doubt about it. But uh, they would have paid upwards of sixty to seventy thousand dollars when you added up all those EOBs: anesthesia bill, facility, physician, implant, nurse, assistant, durable medical, drugs. It just they keep coming, right? Right. Um, today, and we just talked to this member. Um, he not only was verified that he had the best doctor we share with them the quality scores right unlike right. the pto um he parked right in front of that building and you can see the little brick building not only that they built that building you yes, know they, so did. they were part of the construction team that built that building and they spent twenty five thousand dollars flat for the best doctor in winston-salem per knee um saving over you know thirty thousand dollars plus per knee so 60,000 plus for the plan and the member paid nothing. So because the plan is saving so much money, they, they waive the deductible and, and Hero Health, we pay zero out of pocket for the member. Um, and so we feel very strongly in working with you, Karen, and the other Orthoform members of bringing this to more and more members uh, here in North Carolina and across the country. Um, and and I put on there half jokingly that you can stay and recover in a hospital with a four percent infection rate, or we put you up at a four star hotel with your care team and send you a gift basket with a handwritten card for a get well soon. So That's right. it's a uh, it's no comparison. But why aren't more people doing this? I mean, you know, is there any? You know, you've been in this business. You know a lot of these. It's just. It, it just blows my mind how high quality does not equal high cost. Well, and I, you and I have been have become fast and furious friends. And so I do know part of your journey was just the eye opening and draw drop draw dropping experience of actually looking at pricing and really understanding these differentials. So most people in a fully insured plan or even a self-insured plan administered by Buca don't see their data. And right. so they don't, that's not, they're not hitting the face with that in a way where they say, well, how, how is it that that worked out, you know, at one point for 20,000 and at another point for 60. And even if they did see it, they may not understand the nuance that that's really just a side of service differential. I mean, my hats off to our Ortho Carolina partners who've been in the Ortho Forum for uh, probably close to 20 years because they were founding members because not only are they performing those services at an appropriate price point for elective cases, which can be scheduled. Like this is these kind of adult reconstructive cases are scheduled cases, which gives you the opportunity to to prep the patient and to do any kind of preoperative, um, you know, tune up in terms of like uh, hemoglobin A1C or if there's a BMI issue, you have all these opportunities to optimize the patient and then to choose an appropriate side of service based on their presenting um, health condition. Like th there's every reason to do it this way when you know that it's possible. The other thing I would celebrate 
for our families in uh, our ortho families in Virginia and in North Carolina specifically is that uh, hospitals have done a very good job of retaining COPN and the certificate of public need program really means that you as an entrepreneurial physician in either of those states have to wrestle and pay a lot of money to have the uh, have the ability to even deliver cost-effective care in those communities. So it, it was it was didn't just happen, you know, to get a certificate of public need in the state of North Carolina and to do this as an independent physician requires a lot of legal work and costs just to do the right thing for patients in your community. So um, hats off to them for for prov yeah. providing that service at a cost-effective rate and for going through the burden of getting getting to do that. Yeah. So, no, no, I, there's a lot of legal hurdles they've cleared. Uh, so what, what we come to here is just that, saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's the theme of this whole show today, better outcomes, higher incomes, right? So these doctors in your uh, ortho form and our clients, our, our partners, deliver better outcomes over time for working people and employer plans in North Carolina, and they cost less sometimes not half, sometimes a third, but a significant amount less, enabling the true payers, the employers of North Carolina, to offer that for free. Uh, what a benefit to their employees, you know. Absolutely. So hats off to you, because you've been you've been leading the charge on this for so long. We, 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 uh, we really appreciate the pioneering work that you have done uh, nationally and also here in North Carolina. Well, I'm, I'm happy to celebrate my uh, my sister state, and this is where my family's from. My entire family's from North Carolina, Hickory, Charlotte, Raleigh, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm celebrating your victories alongside you, and if I can ever do anything for anybody to bring more cost-effective solutions to them in the musculoskeletal space, I am happy to do that. Well, Karen, I, I'll talk to you for hours later. Uh, I'm sorry that we kind of ran out of time, but that's part of being the last ones on the show. So, uh, right. but, but thank you for the important work that you and your teammates are doing up there. And we look forward to seeing you again in person soon. So, Sounds good, Patrick. Thank, thank, thank you, you so Karen. much. Take, take care. Wow, right. Patrick. Thank you so much. Wow, well, what a session. What a session. We're, We've got a few more minutes uh, to, 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 to wrap up here. Uh, you see there below a slide on Hero. I mean, you've heard a lot about Hero today, right, Patrick? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, you know, Doug, you hear this all the time, but I want to share it real quickly with the audience. It's, our goal is, is to be the best resource for, for the Catapult members. Meet you where you are. You hear that term a lot. Um, whether you're too small to be self-funded, we still want to help. If you're if you're uh, too big, we'll tell you, we can probably offer some advice. If you're just right between the 25 and, and say a thousand members, we certainly would love to talk with you and, and find help, help you meet, meet you where you are and, and help you understand what's under the hood of status quo and, and prioritize what, what could you do? What could you do to improve your plan? That's, that's all. But thank you for the opportunity to share some stuff today. Great, thanks. All right, so a few things to wrap up, and we got. You know, don't, don't, please don't leave yet. I hope you've had a good day today. We've really tried to expose you to both the current waste inefficiencies. Choose your own words from what you heard this morning, because I really think we all need a little of jolt, if you will, to get out of the of somewhat the malaise we all suffer from, me included. Just there, can't, there, there aren't better options out there. Well, you've seen that there are some better options out there that are local and we're happy, happy, happy to help, help you learn more. Uh, you know, I, I also would just remind a couple of key takeaways from today. This is not just about cost. I mean, if you're an HR and you're, you're, the, you're the, the, the shepherd there the, who's that closest to your employees, you know the stories from them. You know the heartache and heartburn that they and their families experience every day when they interact with this system. So it's not just about cost. Hopefully you heard today that it's also about better care options, at least better access, easier access to care. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we spent good amount of time on direct primary care. Like you, I know what I'm used to, which that's not gonna help me at all. It, I get my 7.5 minutes and I'm on assembly line. It's good now to better understand how that, how that concept re really, really works. Last thing, I want to do a quick poll, everyone, so please get ready to answer a poll for us. 
um, as you're doing that, please answer that. But I'm curious, it's interesting to me that to remind everyone, all these solutions today are designed for the small to mid-sized companies. So if you're out there with 30 employees or 50 employees, or uh, th th we're trying to, we as Catapult, along with Hero and others, are trying to bring these, these solutions to you, solutions that may have been out of reach. And we didn't use these words today, but believe me, there are crawl, walk, and run options. So you may want to do 10% of what you've heard. You may want to do 50%. You may want to do all of it. Uh, that's the good, the nice thing about these solutions. It's not kind of, it's not a one size fits all. So again, please everyone answer this first poll to give us a check on kind of where you are, what where, where your mind is right now in terms of learning more about this solution. And then uh, that will help us out a lot. Uh, what kind of results do we have so far, Tucker? Is that something you can show, show me quickly or do I need to keep moving? Okay, there you go. That's good. So sounds like we did a, a reasonable job today. Only 9% are not interested. So thanks again for taking the time. We really appreciate it. It's been a long day. I realize that um, this was the, the shorter version of our ideas. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Millie, why don't you uh, close us out officially? Thank you, Doug. So Bruce, when he opened up the event, he mentioned there were two main objectives. One was to describe in detail what the problem was, and I think we did a good job. And the second was to provide employers with options and tools and solutions for consideration. So again, I think we hit those two very successfully. So big thanks to all the amazing speakers that we had today. They are so passionate for improving healthcare for all. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who came in and supported and participated in the event. So now that we know that you may need just further support, understanding and navigating through the different solutions. So very soon you're going to be receiving an email with several important items. So first, if you wanna learn more about a proactive health benefit solution, we wanna encourage you to register for our upcoming event, how to take control back of your plan with Heroes Health on Wednesday, May the 5th, um, where you're gonna learn more specifics about how it breaks the status quo. Um, now, you also have an opportunity, if you're ready to talk to one of us, to schedule one-on-one -on -one through that email, or you can just simply contact us. So we would love to continue to um, earn your trust and to support the efforts in improving health outcomes and health incomes for employees and employers. So thank you all so much for your time. And with this, we will uh, conclude our event. Thank you all.